CB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, bang on half past seven this Tuesday morning. It's an absolutely massive day of football. Ireland are in Slovakia, playing Slovakia this evening, where victory will make their path to the World Cup that little bit easier. So it's a big game for them. And then obviously Celtic and Real Madrid tonight is the pick of the ties in the Champions League. Uh, Shane Hannan is with us. Shane, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, Joe. How are things? The other breaking news overnight is, um, I don't know if it was late last night or overnight, but Rafa Nadal is gone from the US Open. So the one and two seeds both fell yesterday. The official passing of the guard has happened and um, Novak Djokovic didn't even bother showing up. Kind of emotional, you know, when you see when you see the Federer and Nadal Djokovic triumvirate kind of coast off into the into the distance. We all thought this is going to be around forever. These guys are never going to get old, especially Federer. But yeah, it's kind of it's kind of it's sad, but also good for the sport of tennis. I think it, it's interesting that a lot of those uh, great legends of all the sports. Is this the year that Tom Brady finally like <sighs> retires three games in? It's possible. Convinced he's a robot, he's actually never going to retire. Well, he disappeared for 11 days because he had some family stuff going on in the middle of training camp, which is just an interesting kind of mm, twist. Uh, something's going on. Yeah, yeah. I like the, these these sports stars who you think like Ronaldo's another one where you, you kind of think, okay, he's he's of an age now where yes, certainly retirement is is talked about, but you still think it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. I mean. Yeah, it's just one of those things. You want them to continue for as long as is physically possible out of pure uh, greed on our behalf. I but did I did see um, somebody put together a video of um, Messi the other night and it was still like Messi-esque, you know. Mm. It's, it's not the same and he's not the superstar in the team anymore because, you know, uh, it, it feels like Kylian Mbappe is part owner of um, PSG at the moment. But I do, you know, I think maybe there's a couple, of, couple more seasons of Messi, but is this the end of Ronaldo? It might be. Like, could it, yeah. could it be? Like it could be like I, I guess now that the the thinking is that it's he he's he's there at Old Trafford till the end of the season. Now January obviously will be another temptation for him, but who comes in for him is the is the point. Does he retire from international football at the end of this World Cup? He, he's all about numbers and stats and individual goals. So he he wants to look back at the end of his career and say, look at how many goals I scored. Like he's obviously got the the major honors. He's he's got the team stuff, but but at this stage of his career, he he can be a little bit greedy. I think and, and I think we saw it against. Um, Le- was it the Leicester game during the week when it was 1-0 to United and, and he came on and he did the job he did the effective job and you're thinking he's not actually past it just yet he can still have a role to play uh, now Marcus Rashford probably proved that he could do his own little job uh, at the weekend as well against Arsenal but um, yeah he certainly has a role to play Ronaldo in some in some fashion But for this season but do you think that, that like so what we are seeing like it's likely that uh, at this point so, you know, notwithstanding how well this year has gone for Rafa Nadal, but he keeps talking about the injuries and how it's really sore for him to get on the court. Uh, Federer will come back probably next Wimbledon to have a swan song and that's the end of it. Um, Serena is gone. That, that that era of those great superstars, that is passing. And at the same time, it feels a little bit like this could actually be the end of Ronaldo. Nobody wanted him. <laughs> well, that's the that's the, the scariest thing. And he's still, a, he's still a top talent. My concern, Jer, is that when these sports stars reach the end of their careers, I want to be able to have seen them in person. Now, I've, I'm lucky enough to have seen Ronaldo play at the height of his career and towards the tail end as well in person. But, like, Nadal or Federer, never seen them play. Uh, Tom Brady, I've never seen him play. Like, we we should be quickly, if anyone is watching... Time is them, ticking there, Shane. I mean, Time is ticking. <laughs> I'm going to have to do these things in... in, in, in the next six the, weeks. Literally the next six weeks, probably. But, uh, yeah, it's one of those things that you, you feel like you're going to look back in 10, 20 years and say... Do you know, like, like someone like my dad, my dad got to see Eric Cantona play, for example, and, and if he hadn't, he would look back and say, why didn't I? Why didn't I head over for a match? It was so simple. Uh, so I, I don't want to have those regrets. I feel like I'm going to have some of these regrets. So a trip to Paris to see Messi. And Messi's the big one. Like, if you don't see Messi while he's still playing football, I, I don't know what we're doing. And, and, and I'm one of those people who unfortunately hasn't seen him play. And a trip to Tampa to see Tom Brady. That'd be a good weekend. You could fly direct from Paris to Tampa. The Charles de Gaulle big airport plenty it's of opportunity true. for you it's true yeah 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 so yeah it certainly has to happen but it's going to have to happen pretty quickly I think and, and look the tennis is the tennis the problem is we won't have seen them in their in their complete prime like this is a, a 40 something year old Tom Brady it's a messy well it's a Tom Brady won the Super Bowl eight well fair ago. so I think you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Um, he's, he's still pretty good you want to see him early in the season though before the injuries start kicking in uh, so I don't know you've got to get the finger out there to try and <laughs> sort that out pretty quick uh, Messi I like uh, you know, it would be good to see him play now, but it's nothing. Uh, I I think it's not approximating how <sighs> devastating it was. No, that's here's the thing though. They're, they're, like so, the kids coming through at Barca, they 
like Erling Haaland is going to be one of those players that you want to go mm. and see because um, he will create all sorts of, of records like it's quite probable that he catches and eclipses the goal scoring exploits of Cristiano Ronaldo in whatever league he plays in and in European football so um, that keeps happening it's just I, I don't know if we're ever going to have a, an era in tennis the way we have had no. where there's three all timers who are stealing grand slams off each other and at the same time still reaching and breaking records yeah, like it, 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 it was laughable at a point that the the whole men's uh, majors at, at Wimbledon, especially where it was just like one of these guys, lads is obviously going to win it. It's just a matter of who. Uh, and now, granted, on, on the French Open, it was always Nadal. Federer seemed to dominate a lot of the time until Djokovic came on board as well. But like it, to have to have three individual human beings who dominate a sport so aggressively, uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think we're ever going to see it again. Like. But it could be a nice little era now where the likes of TFO, who obviously knocked out Nadal last night, uh, Medvedev as well, and Nick Kyrgios, I mean... Well, Kyrgios is quite old at this stage. Well, like, yeah. It's possible he wins one or two, and that, that was his destiny, was to win one or two, and he'll be pretty happy with that. Mm. Um, and then, obviously, there's a, a bunch of others who are around that uh, talent level, which means it's going to be super competitive for the next while and a bit more akin to the women's. Uh, if you take out Serena, you kind of have taken out Serena over the last four or five years. It, mm. it hasn't been an incredible time for her to hoover up stuff as well. So we'll talk about that a little later on with Jenny Claffey. We do need to talk about Celtic and what's going on at the moment. Um, Pat Nevin, who we'll hear from a little bit later on, was on the show last night. And he wasn't building the case for them to win the game. But he was saying, you know, football, bloody hell. Like, we we saw Leeds absolutely spank Chelsea. Yeah. Uh, you know, Chelsea aren't Real Madrid, Real Madrid aren't Chelsea. Uh, this Real Madrid team, you'd say, are much further on than this current Chelsea side. Uh, Leeds, I'd say, I'd say Celtic would go Leeds game. Yeah. So, you know, I can see what he's doing. He's like, this isn't equivalent. I'm not making the case. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. It's it's funny, like, when you're, when you're talking about bucket list things, like this, like these Real Madrid players have seen it all and done it all and, and won it all, but a European night in Celtic Park... Uh, with an atmosphere that I, I can only uh, imagine what it's going to be like. It, it's going to be one of the best atmospheres these players have ever experienced. Um, and there's international players in this Real Madrid team that have, you would have thought up to this point seen it all. Um, that like uh, uh, look, both teams are playing very well. That's the point. They've all won, but their games in La Liga and the Scottish Premiership so far, both in form, both full of confidence. I mean, that what impact can fans have on a team's likelihood of winning? Pretty big, I would say. Uh, and under the lights at Celtic Park, and what Ange Postecoglou has done with this team, I mean, and, and he was kind of he spoke about in the press conference before this game as well. And he kind of said, "I'm not going to change what we've been doing." You know, he, he encourages his fullbacks to attack. Um, he, he's, he's got, I think, Farahashi as well. Is 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 maybe started training as well. So, I, I, like, and after coming off an old firm as well, I think I think it's worked out quite nicely the fixtures for them in that a four 0 spiking against Rangers is the perfect lead into a game of this magnitude uh, but yeah uh, yeah uh, you would, you'd think so I mean you, you would, you'd have to say it, it probably is the one thing is that you get very very high after it like um, you do celebrate a lot you do yeah. you do feel wild after beating your uh, derby rivals but not just beating them annihilating them to the point where it might be hard to come down it might be hard to get the rest that you need because over the horizon is a way better team and like, yeah. it's not that far it's actually like that the game has come around like that uh, it's obviously tonight at eight o'clock, and um, you know you you really hope that they do themselves justice and that there's no no bit of a hangover after the weekend and that like they get at least fifteen twenty minutes to feel their way into the game and then see what happens. You see, I think I think the thing for Celtic in the two games against Real is it it will be I, I know people say it's a results business, but it will be very firmly uh, encamped in the the performance matters against Real because I actually think Celtic will fancy their chances of finishing ahead of. Probably both Leipzig and Shakhtar, um, and that's all they need to do. They just need to finish second. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but they'll fancy their chances. You know the way they're playing football at the minute. Um, so the Real games, if they can just put in a good performance, like to look at that Real front three of Benzema, Vinicius, and Rodrigo, especially. I love this Rodrigo kid, and and I mean the confidence he has. Uh, I, I'm just fascinated to see how he deals with with that atmosphere like tonight. Um, but I mean, how Celtic deal with that front three is is a big thing. Like, there's some rumours that maybe Benzema doesn't start tonight, and, and he tries something different. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the live score pre pre lineup actually has a four in midfield for them, which mm. I, haven't, I haven't seen enough of of um, Madrid. I presume they haven't been playing four in midfield, have they? Yeah, well, you see, when when Casemiro left, 
Um, the concern was that they wouldn't have anyone to really slot in, but sure, mainly this new signing has, has come in and like just immediately p- basically picked up where Casemiro left off and, and, and done the same job, if not better. Um, so yeah, like I'd be fascinated to see the Real lineup and whether or not they, they decide to, to leave off with, with Benzema. Like Rodrigo scored his first goal of the season at the weekend. He'd come in with a little bit of confidence himself. Um, but I mean, you, you think of how many Irish fans are on, on the ferry at the right this second over to, to Glasgow and heading over on flights as well. Like Real Madrid in Parkhead in a Champions League group stage match. It, when it's also the opening game of the whole thing, yeah. so... Uh, everything is possible. The bit, the bit in the early season that is everybody's favourite is before the first game. Like uh, you know, uh, for Villa fans, the entire season was over after about twenty five minutes this year. <laughs> but that first week, where we were like, we could finish sixth here. Yeah. If everything goes our way. We're, we're like, this could be amazing. Uh, I mean, Celtic fans would be feeling, you know, it's the hope that kills you. Why can't we be Porto? Yeah, and, and I love the little nuggets as well that give you little bits of confidence. Like people kind of, and Carlo Ancelotti was asked about this in his press conference as well, where he was said his record in in Celtic Park isn't good. Uh, I think when he was AC Milan, AC Milan manager, he managed here at Parkhead three times, 2 nil nil draws and 1-2-1 defeat, the famous nights in, in Celtic Park. And he, he referenced it himself. He says, I don't have, a, I don't have good experiences in, in Celtic Park. Uh, and Jesus, Celtic fans and players would love to, to continue on that record tonight. But that, that's the kind of little nugget that Celtic fans are going to be holding on to. And up until 8 o'clock tonight, you know, at 5-8, to eight, Celtic are going to believe um, now maybe by five past ten past eight the belief will be a little bit dimmer depending on how quick this, they can start this game tonight but if you think back to uh, was it was it last season or was it the season before I don't know if it was during COVID but there were certainly early performances where Real Madrid weren't at it mm. and there was a couple of games where we thought that Real Madrid could go out tonight and then they went out and they, they took care of business it was three or four nil against um, uh, definitely a team from one of the lower leagues in um in Eastern Europe mm. and I remember thinking this is oh, it's very interesting and then obviously they, they like uh, flat track bullies re-emerged and away they go um, was it against Martin O'Neill that he had those bad times or was it somebody else oh, I, I, I can't good remember question. It, it could have been it could have been the Martin O'Neill era um, yeah I, I'm not actually sure who it was but like that, that's the thing the, the Real games so far this season they haven't started games well um, and the other thing is as well they've been winning games in La Liga that are high-scoring matches, and they've been conceding a lot of goals as well as scoring. Celtic will will thrive off that. I mean, Celtic obviously a very attacking team, um, like so much attacking. Now maybe not the, the level of attacking talent that that Real Madrid have, but if they, if they can start well, and Real Madrid have started very poorly in some games. I think it's actually Strachan era. Strachan was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I, but those were famous nights, and if if Celtic can replicate, they will replicate the atmosphere. There's no question about that. Um, I've only been to I've been to Parkhead I think twice. We used to in our in our school in Monaghan, St McCartan's College. We had a transition year school trip every year, and the school trip was Celtic Park. All right. So we wow. actually, actually went over twice, I think. Wow. That, that was the that was the school trip. And did you all behave, or were you all? You know what? Not really. Like we went over on the ferry with um with a few teachers, and the teachers were you know they had their couple of pints and enjoyed themselves as well, and you know the students. It was one of those kind of the nagging in the toilets of the ferry kind right. of job. Puking. Puking, of course, yeah. Rough rough seas on the way home, especially. That was, it was the seas, yeah. <laughs> which which what didn't make it easy. But I think it was Inverness, Caledonian Thistle and Dundee United were the two games I saw in the Scottish Premiership. Did you both go over in the same, twice in the same year? It was twice in the same year, I think, yeah, yeah, two yeah. Two school trips. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, they ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, exactly. But they were good fun. But I, I never got to see them in a, on a European night under lights, which which I think would be a totally different. Now, don't get me wrong, the atmosphere was great, but it's three o'clock on a Saturday. Yeah, it's not quite the same. Yeah, um, was there an old firm under lights last year for the first time in ages? Was that what happened? Is that why it was such a big deal? Rings a bell when, um, they, when they were doing um, uh, roll with it afterwards on the on the pitch because obviously they hadn't had old firms in the evening for ages for all of the, the associated reasons of course. Um, trouble. But uh, that certainly seemed like it was unusual. And you could just, like, that's definitely one of those things you want to go and see. Oh, now, 100%. Um, David Myler was talking to us on um, the football kickoff last Friday and he was saying he brought his dad over and they lost 3-0 and his dad was like, that's literally the worst football game I've ever seen. <laughs> never, never bring me here again. Yeah, yeah, it's um, the quality sometimes can be. But it, it's funny because even listening to Roy Keane recently, I, I, was it on the, I think it was on the one of the shows that you, you, Gary Neville does where you, you watch back the old matches um, and, like, he, he said, do you regret you know, leaving United when you did and he was saying and maybe not and going on to Celtic and playing more football but he said you know getting the chance to play for Celtic as an Irishman as a Cork man uh, and to play in old, fir- in old firms that's like that's a game that's like the that's like the Lazio Roma the Milan Derby the 
United Liverpool. That's why like that's why I went over to Old Trafford last year for United Liverpool. I was thinking this is this is a fixture that you need to see at once. Now Liverpool tanked them five 0 and Mo Salah ran rings around Harry Maguire. So for United fans it wasn't too fun. But there are certain fixtures in football that I think you have to go out of your way to experience once in your lifetime. 100%, 100%. If you get the chance to go and if you've been and uh, you want to share some insights or memories, you can get us 087 180 180. That's the WhatsApp number. Of course, you can always get in touch with us by leaving a comment on the YouTube stream. Patrick McHugh has done so and he says, as a Celtic man in Australia, I don't think people understand how big Ange Postacoglu is here. His track record is truly excellent. He is special. I hope Celtic give a good account versus Real. Sneaky draw. Like <laughs> You take a draw as a Celtic fan without a shadow of a doubt we were talking about this about how disappointing they were in European football last year I think you have to make an accommodation that that's the first season where you're getting in seeing exactly what the squad is like seeing who you can trust seeing what everything underneath that is like as well and spending a lot of time and then all of a sudden the European fixtures come and you're like well if I win the league this year everybody's going to be happy so he's done that and um, you know he's saying that he he's in no rush he wants to build a team who can actually compete in this competition and like if he's capable of doing that, you know, you hope he gets the backing in the transfer window. Mm. The, the, the point is, do you have to sacrifice the Scottish Premiership in, in some degree in order to... It turns out no. Yes. Probably not. It turns uh, out no. Uh, you can smash them. You can smash your rivals. You can yeah. have the league season won by Christmas. Be ready for the old firm games and then you can kind of coast through the rest uh, with all due respect to the other teams in the well, Scottish The style of play isn't about coasting, is it though? It's, it's, it's very heavy metal football. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. Oh, it's, it's attacking, it's attacking full backs. It's, it's supporting Callum McGregor. It's for Hash. It's just these guys who nobody had heard of and Ange Postacoglu brings in. And to be fair, nobody had heard of Ange Postacoglu really before he became Celtic manager. Uh, and for a while people were like, what's this going to be like? And he's just been a breath of fresh air. I saw him at David Clifford at Parkhead at the weekend. Um, and, and, and a bunch and some friends yeah, yeah. and a lot of other GA heads but um, it was a bit like David Beckham um, and Robbie Keane and the uh, uh, US media reporting David Beckham and friends yeah. and some fans uh, meet, who were they meeting was it LeBron yeah, somebody yeah. it was somebody it was one of the Lakers anyway uh, so obviously it wasn't LeBron or it could have been LeBron was it pre-LeBron era I would have said Beckham was there in LA before LeBron was there so I don't know it was Kobe it was Kobe of course it was and um, yeah there was a there was a bang of that off it. Kevin Casty was like, "Look, I'm I'm here too," but uh, the rest <laughs> of them were like, uh, "You know." Yeah, yeah, it's fair, but like, yeah, always meet your heroes. Yeah, but I I love I love hearing that, and I remember when David Clifford was on with ourselves and off the ball, like he spoke about his own heroes, and, and you forget that David Clifford is a hero for a lot of young Gaelic footballers in this country, especially down uh, down in the kingdom. But you forget that these guys are heroes as well, and there are people that they looked up to, and and reasons why they got involved in sport at the highest level. Mightn't be there in their own chosen sport, um, but even like he, when he spoke about Celtic and he spoke about Ronnie O'Sullivan and, and wanting to get over and see Ronnie at the Crucible, you know, while he's still playing at the top level, those are those are little nuggets that you can see why someone like David Clifford got to the level he's at because he clearly watches sport, analyzes sports people, uh, and has a brain for for seeing what, what they have done well and maybe not so well in their careers. Has some physical gifts too, you'd have to say. He's, he's, you know? he's fairly naturally talented as well. Uh, I'll give him that. He's a, he's a decent footballer. Yeah. Um, Cassidy was saying he could do a job for us up front and I was making the point that, like, you know, they should just give him a trial. Get him over for a week. <laughs> like, why not, you know? Well, you, you saw the goal, wasn't it? The goal he scored against Galway where he did the, the whole step over and or dragged the, the drag back behind himself and then tapped the ball. Into, like, I'd say Clifford could do a job for Celtic. You know? <laughs> if he had just focused on soccer instead of Gaelic, who knows where he could have gone down? You know, he's, he's that much talent. He's one of those annoying, you know, those annoying fellas at school that, that are just unbelievable at everything. Like there was a fella I was I was in class with who went on to play for County for Monaghan, and he won a I think he won a World Handball Championship. He was unbelievable at soccer. He was really smart. You know, just. You hate Piss people, off. don't you? You know, just yeah, give us a break. It's 7.49, OTBA. I'm brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Here's what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock this morning. We uh, go on to Slovakia to join Ashley O'Reilly. We'll talk to Sue Ronan about tonight's game. From a tactical perspective, we'll bring in the sports pages and news at 8.35 with John Duggan, including some thoughts on the GA season as it stands at the moment. Jenny Claffey's going to join us in studio to talk to us about the tennis. We'll talk Serena. We'll talk the end of Nadal if he's getting knocked out in the fourth round at this stage. Maybe his time as a potential US Open champion is over. Matt Williams is going to join us at 10 past nine. We'll talk referees. We'll talk um, uh, Malachi Fekatoa has uh, started the preseason really well. Obviously, it's only preseason. We'll wait and see. But he's going to be playing for Tonga in the World Cup against Ireland. 
that's an interesting uh, evolution in um, the strength of the uh, teams um, around New Zealand who had used to be uh, breeding grounds for players or for talent for New Zealand but aren't anymore and then Pat Nevin obviously going to talk about um, tonight's game between uh, Celtic and Real Madrid and of course the uh, weekend shenanigans too if you want to get in touch uh, 0879 180 180 is the WhatsApp number let's go to Slovakia and join Ashling O'Reilly Ashling, how are you? Good morning from Bratislava lads how are you? Yeah here are the votes uh, what are the votes? <laughs> what, what is? Um, there are some Ireland fans there we're going to hear from them in a few minutes but the, you've been talking to the camp you've been following this camp now for months and months and months and months and the old ebb and flow of a, a proper qualifying campaign they've achieved something really good but the job isn't done just yet so how do they pitch that over the last couple of days and what are they saying when they're talking to you in the press conferences and stuff? Yeah, I think that's the main thing that they know the job's not done that on Thursday night against Finland you know, there was massive celebrations after the game and rightly so you know, it was a a massive occasion but uh, it's all about trying to get the the three points now here in Slovakia and they've just stressed how important that is and they're on a roll at the minute and they're constantly developing and growing as a team and they want that to continue so they don't want to have an upset of a bad performance or you know be upset walking away from Slovakia knowing that they could have put themselves in the best position possible and um, to get a, a, a good playoff position so um yeah that's the main thing that they're getting across here and um, but I think overall just with the squad they just how much they've developed like we'll hear from Vera but she, she just spoke about you know, it's so exciting to watch them game on game and they're constantly learning um, together and they're constantly growing together. And it's evident within their play. And even with the injuries that they have, you know, they they do have some girls out. They have four girls that are not going to be playing um, due to injuries and suspensions. But, you know, the strength and depth within this squad is, is really strong. And that's something that maybe in previous years they haven't always had. You know, they can look at the bench and know, yeah, she can do a job. And that was actually the words that Louise said to me. She knows I, I look left and right in the dressing room and I say, she can do a job, she can do a job. You know, they they trust everyone around them. And I think that's really important in international football too because you don't get a lot of time together. You know, you're you're with your club and then, you know, you, you have the 10-day camp really is what they get. So um, you need to be able to trust the players around you. And I think that's very evident within this squad. It's funny because they, they did try and, and hothouse a little bit of that with the, the various camps that they had. They played their friendly against the Philippines and they were, they were on a few trips in the summertime that weren't like very widely reported on because the games were totally meaningless. But from their perspective, it was an opportunity to try stuff, to drill in exactly where everybody's supposed to be on the pitch. And I suspect that one of the things they were doing behind those closed doors was moving Katie McCabe around a bit to see could they get her on the ball more and not just play her at left wing back. This is it. It was constantly changing players around. Um, even Jess Sue, like she's came into the squad as well. And, you know, for West Ham and she- for Shells, anyway, she's playing more of a defender. Now she's pushed up to midfield and she's doing a great job for West Ham there. Um, just in pre-season now at the minute, she's going to have her first game now next week. But, yeah, she, she, a player like her, you know, a lot of the players are versatile, like you said, with Katie McCabe. And I think that's such a strong thing that Ireland have at the minute. Um, you look at the bench and you just look at like the likes of Anya Borman, like, you know, to come off the bench, maybe she might get a start, you know, today. It'd be amazing for Anya to get an experience she has. And obviously the, there's a few girls out at the minute. So to be able to drop players like that in and know that you're in safe hands is, is amazing to have. And it's definitely something the squad have, but they're constantly growing. Like I, I asked Vera yesterday about mentally, like sometimes maybe previously, say against the the Finland game, for example, in the first half, not the best performance, not the start they would have wanted. You know, heads can drop and it wasn't the case. You know, they went in at half time and, you know, they, they rectified things. They talked about it. They came back out and, you know, they said previously we could have dropped our heads there, but they feel like they're they're so much stronger now as, as a group. And yeah, they, they're just so excited for the, the journey they're on and they're just hoping that it continues. Uh, I did wonder if they were just a little bit nervous as well. Like so, I don't think mm-hmm. tactically they got it right. I think they're still working some bits out, and uh, they were trying too much to pump the ball forward early. So that was all part of it. But I do wonder if that's them actually thinking, "Oh Jesus, we might qualify for a World Cup here if we win this game. We're guaranteed at least a playoff." Oh look, the crowd is full. Oh, everybody's talking about us. And then actually half an hour in, they're like, "Okay, we need to like get down to business here." Because the difference between the middle thirty minutes and the first thirty minutes 
was marked and it wasn't just down mm. to like you know I, I don't know it's hard to know it, it's hard to know and I, I do think the the whole thing of the crowd and the buzz before the game like there was a massive buzz compared to other games yes there has been a great buzz ahead, ahead of other games but this was different and the girls said it you know it was different it was you know to qualify for you know a world cup qualifier you know it's it was to get a playoff, you know, it really was a, a massive occasion for them. And that was evident, as you said, you're like, they, they did look a bit nervous. They weren't playing the game that they're used to keeping the ball, moving it fast. It was, as you said, launch it forward and panic stations a little bit almost. Um, but they they rectified it. And yeah, I don't think overall they'd be delighted with that performance. It's definitely probably a learning curve. Um, but I'd say with the fans and the noise and the hype around it too, probably added to that pressure of one of the biggest, if not the biggest moment in an Irish jersey for all of the girls. Something, uh, Ashley seemed different about Vera Pau after at full time after the game during the week. Like, I, I, I've never seen her react like that to it. And look, granted, it was a huge, huge result for this Irish team. But like you've spoken to Vera at different times. Like, ha, have you noticed something different about her in recent days that, that, that this is maybe the precipice of something really, really good for this Irish team? Yeah, I think so, Shane. Like, even yesterday, She's very calm in the press conference. That's something that all the journalists said afterwards. We were like, wow, very, very calm and very excited. And um, yeah, just just really proud of these girls and what they've achieved and what she's achieved and the whole backroom team have achieved so far on this journey. Um, I think the most exciting thing, and I said it to her, I said, is the most exciting thing is that the growth that you've seen and that game on game, they're constantly growing and developing. And she said, absolutely. She's like... You know, it's it's not that we haven't always been mentally strong. She's like, it's just the communication and I suppose being so close off the pitch, you can you can notice that with the team, you know, being close off the pitch, you're gonna be close on the pitch. You know, a lot of, of the, the most successful teams will always always tell you that. And I think that's evident here too. So I think she's just um yeah, excited and she she's like even the talent she has around her within the squad. You know, it really is something else. And as we said about the players on the bench, even coming in, um, yeah, she has a great p to, a squad to pick from. So she's just really um, proud and excited about this journey she's on with them. And yeah, what they've done in recent time, it's brilliant. And yeah, I did speak to her um, yesterday at the press conference. And yeah, she just told me about that excitement, watching these girls grow and develop. And she did describe as the game tonight again, she described it as a final. I can hear that now. And have you had a bit of a difficult job in picking the team and getting things together ahead of the game because there has been some injuries and some changes ahead of the game? Yes, uh, we we, um, we miss four players uh, of the basic lineup, and um, yeah, of course you need to find uh, other players for it. But the the backups are always there. Uh, Tom Elm is always coaching the the. the opposition team so they grow together with the ones in the lineup uh, the only thing is communication um, there will be some misunderstandings on the pitch and that should not frustrate anyone uh, not on the pitch not outside the pitch and not at home because that is very very logical in a game at this level um, when you need for for new players in we were speaking with the Slovakia manager today he said that his contract runs out after the Ireland game that he's hoping to stay on and that, you know, obviously trying to get the win here would be the big thing in order to, I suppose, ensure that he, he keeps his job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What do I say about that? It's, that that's his uh, uh, the, the situation. Mm -hmm. We are here, here to win the game. Uh, we will do everything to win the game because that gives us a better starting point for the playoffs. Mm -hmm. He said that Ireland were the dark horses and he's been very impressed with them throughout the, the campaign. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks to him. We are, well. We have uh, we have surprised ourselves also by times. Eh? Yeah. Uh, we knew that what what is in this squad, and we still don't know where we can g grow to. Uh, and every game is getting better and better and better. But to be honest, the only game that we did not get what we won that was against Slovakia. They made it so difficult for us, and we were very lucky to uh, to have a draw at home. Is that the most exciting part that you're constantly growing game on game? Yes, that is that is so good, and we're getting stronger, more confident. And as you, if you see the, the problems that you had in the first 20 minutes against Finland, and just just the mentality, we don't understand what's happening here on the pitch, but we just make sure that ball does not go in with everything we have.
That was something that Louise talked about there in the press conference that maybe a few years ago, you know, your heads might have went down or now they're so strong mentally not to, to let that sort of start phase them. I, I don't think they were less uh, mentally less stronger. Be the tasks are clearer now. Mm -hmm. So they know what to do when, when it doesn't go away. And they know what to do to keep that ball out of the net or to have the biggest chance to keep the ball out of the net. And uh, by growing that task and the executing of those tasks, it looks like we are mentally further, but it's just having a better knowledge in the execution of your task. And how important is it to get the win tomorrow night? It's extremely important. We, we see this as a final again. This game, we have to win to have a chance to go to the World Cup. The game is live tonight on OTV Sports Radio, uh, Slovakia against Ireland. It's all thanks to Sky, proud partner and supporter of our women's national football team. Out Believe Together and show your support as Ireland look to make history and reach their first ever World Cup. Um, the, the point that I think a lot of people have kind of forgotten after the win at the weekend was like, ah, oh, we've beaten the third best team in the group and as the fourth best team. Of course we'll beat them, but actually they have massively improved over the course of this campaign. That head coach that you were talking to, he's getting a lot of credit for that and he's desperate for a victory because if he beats Ireland, then they're definitely going to give him a new deal. This is it, yeah, Peter Capone. So he, he's the Slovakian manager and has been for the last four years and he is hoping to stay on. So in the press conference yesterday, I spoke to him first and my first question was just, um, you know, how's preparations been going and yeah just a, an open-ended question and he came back with my contract is is up after this game <laughs> come and, and get me please yeah <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah so exactly like my contract is up and um yes yeah, so I'm, I'm he didn't say i'm hoping to stay on i then asked him so would you like to stay on he sort of smiled and say that's a tough question of course i'd i'd hope to stay on but it's, it's up to them so basically yeah, he, he would love to stay on, but uh, he knows that if he got a win against Ireland, that it would really help his chances of staying on. Um, he's been a great manager anyways for them. You know, he, they have really grown in the last number of years. They just haven't had that big win. I think that's probably been the problem for Slovakia because they, they have been an upset for a lot of teams, like Ireland at home, Tala to, to get a draw. You know, they've been a difficult team. Uh, Finland as well, they took pin, points off Finland. So, they have been a difficult team and they're really hoping that this is the, their chance to, to get that big win. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't be underestimating Slovakia or under any illusion of the, the challenge that they that they possess. Am I right in saying, uh, Ash, that he, 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 the Slovakian manager brought up Megan Campbell's long throws as well? or He was, he was certainly asked about it. He, he's obviously a, either a fan of it or, or slightly fears it a little bit. Yeah, the minute he was asked about it, he just smiled. And he just said, yes, yes. And, and we were explaining Meg Cavalier. He was like, I know her, I know her. <laughs> and he said, you know, that we play the videos for the rest of the, the management team. And he said, you know, when we watched those videos, um, we were taken back with that skill that she has. Um, that, it, yeah, it's a phenomenal skill to have. And, um, yeah, they, they know exactly how much of a, of a threat that she is. Um, but yeah, they were just speaking about in, I think it was 2017, where when I think Megan Strohs, it, it scored, it's got two goals for Ireland um, in, here in Slovakia, against Slovakia. And it was 2-0 that day. And he spoke about that day and he was assistant coach then. And yeah, he, he remembers her well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Vic McCarthy's long throws, Euro 88. There's a, there's yeah. a lot of parallels here between our uh, first great team breaking through and this team breaking through as well. Uh, let's hear from Louise Quinn. So, um, obviously, uh, a, a long and storied career, hopefully going to be crowned with an appearance at the World Cup. This is Louise Quinn speaking with Ashton yesterday. Have a look. Louise, we're here in Senec in Slovakia. How are you feeling ahead of the game tomorrow night? Yeah, just feeling good, ready to go. Um, you know, we know what's what's to come tomorrow and, yeah, we've just got to, we've just got to look forward to it and, you know, and, and still we just want to finish as high in this group as we can. We're just looking out at the pitch at the moment. Uh, it looks well. You've been here before. You've played here before. Yeah, I played here a couple of times, and I think it's you know it's definitely been kind of weather affected, but it's looking yeah it's looking really kind of sharp out there, and and uh, yeah, a good surface. And there is a few injuries within the camp, um, suspensions as well. So I suppose going into a game like this, there will be a lot of changes. Um, how does that affect the team? Um, yeah, there's going to be a few changes, but. That's it's something now that we've we've kind of got to a stage where players can come in and it's you know once we have kind of the right setup the right formation players are just able to slot in so easily and um, players who have already their experience international experience um, 
you know, playing at club level together with, you know, some of us mixing in that. So for us, it's we know that's international football and. Um, yeah, listen, we're going to be we're going to be ready first. We've a, we've a really really strong squad that's kind of been been together now for a long time. So, and what is the mood and the buzz like in the camp? Obviously, yeah, you had the brilliant win on Thursday night, so you're on such a high, and then you sort of have to keep your your head on the ground, your your feet on the ground, even going into this game to hopefully get the three points. Yeah, I think that was you know we enjoyed that moment after the game. We had to. It's it was it was so worthy. But yeah, listen, I think even just looking into you know, even reading about the potential playoffs and what can happen, that just confuses you so much that you just have to go, do you know what, we, and as we always do, take the game as it comes, you know, get the three points and then see what happens from there. Um, you know, we are, we're a very grounded team. We uh, we don't take anything for granted. We don't think anything's going to be be given for us. And, you know, we also don't think things are going to be easy for us. We've always been, been fighting through things and we'll continue to do that. I don't think we'll lose it. And for Slovakia, they're a very physical team. Um, what challenge do they possess that's probably going to be the toughest thing tomorrow night? Yeah, exactly. Physicality. They're very, um, you know, very fast as well. They press the ball very well. They come together as units. They, you know, really try to bring you into tight areas and then close you down and, and try win the ball from there and transition very fast. So they will be a very, you know, they have a lot of technical players as well. So we know that we've got a really tough game. It's, it's not one of those, um, you know, before that we think... You know, this will be something we can we can do because they're a lower seed. They're a very very strong side, and you know, and you know, they proved that as well in Tala. But we've we've got a point to prove as well, and we've come so far since then. You said there that uh, you're in Senek. A quick uh, Google tells me Senek is a town in the Bratislava region of southwestern Slovakia, a well-known summer tourism and recreation centre. The town is attractive not only because of the proximity of Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia, but also because of the healthy environment and summer resort. What's Ooh, what's the wow. he- what's the healthy environment? Is like the air clean or something? The water nice? Well, it's it's, it's at a lake. I, I was there for about thirty minutes. Uh, well, we, outside for about thirty minutes. They were inside for about an hour or two, and that was it. Because it's about um, a thirty minute, thirty five minute drive. So we got taxi to and from Bratislava out to the press conferences, and the taxis over here are like something out of Fast and Furious. I don't know <laughs> if any of you have been to Slovakia. Have there once? Holding on for dear life, like they go around a corner and it's as if they 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 don't know how to break. They go faster. It's as if you're going to go up on two wheels. And yeah, we had some crack on the way to and from the the press conferences, but we got back alive. So all's good. But did I uh, did in, I think Bratislava was one of, one of the stops on my interrailing trip when I was when I was younger. It'll be the probably it works out time wise. I know you're a big Celtic fan as well, Ash. You'll get the full Irish game in and the post match reaction, and then is it that isn't it the Dubliner pub in the middle of Bratislava? Is, is the big Irish pub? Yes, um, Shane, you have it all scoped out, so do I. <laughs> I know, and I'm loving all the Celtic coverage. I'm like, it was brilliant yesterday on the show as well. Um, exciting times for Celtic, so yeah, looking forward to it as well. Uh, but it's, yeah, the timing works well here. I'll see, obviously, a press, uh, obviously, to get to the game or the post-match interviews afterwards and all of that. And I'll probably watch it myself, maybe tomorrow or something. You know, I'll mm. sit down and watch it properly, but... Uh, yeah, the Dubliner is in the middle of uh, Bratislava here. It's a very quaint city, sort of like, um, reminds you of Prague, maybe a quieter version of, of Prague. But yeah, really, really nice place. So it is, I definitely, definitely will come back. It's uh, it's on the Danube. I didn't realise that. Um, yeah. Um, I'm learning mm-hmm. a lot about my uh, <laughs> yeah. Slovakian geography today. And Senek seems pretty nice, like uh, as half an hour away. Um, I think we could do a geography with Jer Slot. Uh, yeah, that sounds yeah. good. Yeah. All, my, all my knowledge of European geography comes from... Um, the UEFA Cup circa 1985 <laughs> to 1989 well it was still in existence um, and, and like look notwithstanding that there are some fans who have made the trip I guess um, you know this is probably pretty easy to get to I think there's Ryanair flights I think um, mm-hmm. yeah so uh, who are we going to hear from here? Yeah so I've met a few fans uh, throughout the last two days or so and you do see the jersey dot around the place which is great to see uh, the people have made the journey over and yesterday I met with seven-year-old super fan Annie Mulholland and her dad Alan. They're from Newbridge in Kildare and they have been at the last couple of games. Their first game was against Sweden in Gothenburg and I, I, that was the first time I met them at that game and they've travelled again over here to Slovakia for this game. So yeah, I met a very excited Annie yesterday. They're, they're absolutely a smashing bunch of uh, the staff, the team, you know, all, all the people in the background, the management, they're, they're phenomenal. And what they do for young girls in this country, they inspire them, you know, they, they can see them, they, they can do this. Um, I'm, you know, supporting football and playing football 
35 years I've never seen a team to have such a close bond and relationship with the fans mm-hmm. and that was even evident on, on Thursday night yeah, there seems to be a different buzz at the moment. You know, everybody's getting behind them and it's because they, they, the style of football they play, of course, the talent that they have, but they're a real likeable bunch of girls too. You know, they're, they're a great crack. They're really warm with, with all the fans. They're out speaking to them all. They're signing autographs. And what do you think Absolutely. the difference is in this last few years that we're seeing this growth in the game in Ireland? I think, um, I think the girls themselves, probably the role models they had to look up to was, was male players. Uh, and the male football team and they're in a situation now where, where they can inspire the girls of the country mm-hmm. and, and they know what they have faced and they're trying to make the path that little bit easier for, for Annie and the, and the likes to mm-hmm. come through. And yesterday you met the team at the airport we were on the same flight and you actually waited around <laughs> for the team to come in off their flight which was an hour and a half later so that's yeah. how much of a dedicated fans you are. Yeah, well... This little lady got wind that they were travelling in the air behind us and we thought it was an hour and a half wait. I think it was nearly closer to two hours by the time they landed. But like once again, they came through those screens and they saw her and it was like <laughs> high fives and chats and, you know, uh, photographs and all that kind of stuff. They're, they're a very, very special bunch and they really deserve to qualify for a World Cup. Mm-hmm. They really, really do. And if they qualify, what's going to happen, Alan? Are you already thinking about these trips you're going to have to make? Even the playoff, will you be at the playoff? The, the playoff, the playoff, wherever that is, we'll probably go to the playoff. Hopefully it'll be a home draw. But, but, you're but, praying for that, Alan. But if we, if we have to go away, we probably will go away. And then I think we might, uh, we might save a few, Bob, will we? And go to Australia? Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah, we might. If they qualify, sure. We'd have to go and support them. They, they deserve that support, I think. Well, Annie, you'd have to go, wouldn't you? You're their lucky charm. You'd have to go to Australia. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And who is your favourite player that plays for Ireland at the minute? I have three. Ian Kernan, Denise O'Sullivan and Katie McCabe. And why are they your favourites? Because they're very good. And Leanne has the same hair as me. <laughs> and are you lucky to be able to come and travel with them to go see all the games? Yeah. Are you Ireland's number one supporter? Yeah. Tell us why. Because um, it was my birthday in Sweden and they they heard that it was my birthday so they invited me to the training session so they got to know me and then now they know me. So they're my yeah. friends. Oh, well, that's brilliant. And one day do you hope to be playing for Ireland? Yeah. That's the plan? Yeah. That's uh, Annie Mulholland and her dad, Alan, talking with Ash there. I, I think it... Um, we shouldn't underestimate how important the way that the team makes themselves available for media and fans and signing autographs and just this like umbilical connection that they have with people who go to their games. It's winning everybody over. It's swelling the crowd. It's making the bandwagon a real thing. It's getting everybody in, in behind them. And it'd be very easy for them to be like, oh, I'm game face. I've got to be Tiger Woods. I've got to like keep myself to myself. But they're the complete opposite of that. They're actually... They're volunteering to do extra media. They're like desperate to get the message out there and to influence the crowd. And, and Vera Power was talking in the press conference about those people who didn't show up for the empty seats. Mm-hmm. It was a point that we'd raised. It was kind of like, oh, there's just one thing we want to talk about. And she's like, yeah, we do, do need to talk about this. If you get a seat, you show up. And no one's going to turn it down. No one's going to say, oh, yeah, OK, uh, uh, screw you. They're like, oh, yeah, absolutely. We will do what we're told because you're in charge now. But that bit where they welcome the young fans and they're hanging out with them, you know, there was definitely a period of time where the men's team would have been like, oh, uh, I'm on my phone, I'm looking over the other way, I'm not a part of this. They're like definitely setting a different tone, their own tone. Yeah, because I think they've wanted this for so long. They they wanted to have this recognition. They Even when they were growing up, they wanted to have these, you know, female players to look up to and it wasn't really the case. You know, it, it, it just wasn't, you know, they looked up to, to male players and that was, that's just the way it was. But now it, they know that they're these role models for these young girls and boys as well, you know, and just young players in general across Ireland. And I think the main thing is that they're just, they wanted it for so long. They wanted this coverage um, and they're backing it up with the play. You know, they're getting the results and everybody's getting behind them because of that. And they're just enjoying the journey they're on. So they're absolutely a joy to be around anytime that I've interviewed them or had the chance. You know, they've 
gave me more time than they should you know we're told okay three questions we're still talking five minutes later and you know they're happy to a lot of the time you know they, they they're they just yeah really enjoying it all and I think when you're that comfortable too uh, it's it's just really evident when, when they're out there as squad even training yesterday we got to watch 15 minutes of the training before they got into the tactical stuff they, they weren't letting us in on that but you know, you, you just see the the crack as a team, the definitely the the fun they have together. And that is all evident then when they go out on the pitch. And yeah, the relationship they have up here as well is really strong. So I think as a whole, just Irish football, uh, yeah, it's in a good place. Uh, give me predictions for both games tonight then. Start with the Ireland one. <laughs> the Ireland game. Okay, I'm going to go with 1-0. 1-0 to Ireland. We'd be delighted with that. We'd bite your hand off for that. And then we uh, would. the game at Parkhead. This is a tough one, Real Madrid. It's it's not an easy task. Um, but Celtic are in a great place at the minute. Exciting times. Uh, loving the football they're playing, the style of play they're playing. So I will say, at home, I am going to go with two one to Celtic. That's oh, hard. Win, you. right? I thought you were going to go two all, and everybody would be like, "Oh, yeah, that's fair enough." But no sitting on the fence for you, Ash. That's uh, what no, we, that's no, why, I'm going to back them. That's why we love your predictions. Yeah. Uh, right, more from Ash across the day. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks, lads. Uh, as I said, live coverage this evening of that game. Um, Nathan, on commentary duty for you. And uh, we'll just make sure you're listening to OTB Sports Radio. You just say, uh, Alexa, play OTB Sports Radio. And uh, away you go. Um, or uh, whatever the Google version of it is. <laughs> OK, Google. OK, Google. I think that's it. that is exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We are brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today. Sue Ronan is standing by. We're going to get to her next. OTB. AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Off the ball. It, oh, it's been ruled out with Charleston's uh, goal. This is the, the pain of AOR. 2 1 out to Fulham. Five minutes of stoppage time. We're in the 92nd minute of the moment. Shane Duffy, you don't think it's got on? He got booked as well for taking his jersey off for Charleston. I mean, the ultimate pain of getting booked for a goal is this allowed because you took your top off. I mean, I mean, imagine if that booking I mean, cost them later in the season. Yeah, I can't imagine Lara did that in the, uh, the 80s, to be honest. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. Things that put people off on a first date. Showing up late and getting your name wrong. Always a great start. Looking at their phone more than you? Eh, uh, hello. Someone who only talks about themselves. Oh, really? God, aren't you great? Look, no one said dating is perfect, but at godating.ie, we promise we'll always try and find your perfect match. Because somewhere out there, there's someone for you. And godating.ie will help you find them. Yes, even you, socks and sandals guy. Go on, go for it with godating.ie. If your business relies on a van, that wouldn't sound good. But this does. Get up to 75% off van insurance. Now available in FPD branches nationwide. FPD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. 75% no claims discount based on five years claims free. Available on new van policies. Used for farm or business purposes. Terms and conditions apply. Underwritten by FPD Insurance PLC. FPD Insurance Group Limited trading as FPD Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM. With Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Right, it's competition time. We've teamed up with one of Europe's largest sports events, ticketing and hospitality companies, Champions Travel, to give you the opportunity to win a €250 Champions Travel voucher each day this week that can be used on Premier League match trips as well as a host of other sporting events. Daily winners will be entered into our grand prize draw where one lucky winner will win a trip from a selection of Premier League games with flights and two nights accommodation included. To enter, tell us who this man is giving his best Liz Truss impression. Crimes and wars will multiply. I love football. You can tweet us your guess on our main Twitter account, which is at Off the Ball. Who's this? Crimes and wars will multiply. I love football. We are selling tea to China. Right, uh, Ireland play Slovakia tonight. We need a win. And um, Sue Ronan is with us to try and explain how we might go about getting it. Sue, how are you? Good, dear and Shane. How are you keeping? Yeah, uh, good. Um, you were pretty much bang on with your prediction for what was going to happen um, uh, in the last game. How are you feeling about this one with the injuries and the suspension mounting up a little bit for us? Yeah, we have a few key players missing tonight. Um, but I, I think we have a good depth in our squad now that we probably haven't had for, uh, ever in the past and certainly for, for a number of years. 
Um, you know, so I think we certainly have players that can, that can slot in and, and uh, you know, work in the system that Vera and our staff are implementing in the team. Um, obviously, players of the calibre of Megan Connolly, Jamie Finn, Rusha Littlejohn, they're a huge loss. Um, you know, together with Niamh Fahey already out of the game. But um, as I mentioned, I think we have players that, that can slot in. You know, it'll be interesting to see who she, she, who she plays. Um, there's a number of young, good, great young players in the squad from even from the, the Women's League, our own league uh, here in Ireland. Um, I, I would expect her probably to maybe stick with some of the tried and trusted players from over the years. I certainly think Lily Ag has done herself absolutely no harm whatsoever. I thought she was fantastic when she came on the other night. She changed the game. Not only did she score the goal, I thought she was brilliant in midfield. Um, we seem to get on the ball more when she came on. So I think she's probably played herself in or should have played herself into the team uh, in midfield. Um, potentially maybe Harriet Scott or Anya Gorman to replace Jamie Finn at right back. Um, and then we have a number of options then uh, to replace Rusha Littlejohn. Personally, I'd like to see maybe Jess Sue play in the number 10 or even Ellen Malloy from her own league. Um, put Heather Payne back wide and then play either... Lucy Quinn or, or um, Leanne Kiernan up top, who will definitely score goals. Leanne Kiernan is scoring goals for fun with Liverpool at the moment. You know, you know. So she's plenty of options there. There's a, there's another number of other forwards who can play up top also. Saoirse Noon and Amber Barrett, um, Kyra Caruso. So it'll be interesting to see what Vera does. Is that the first time that you felt we have had that type of strength and depth where you can take four players out of the team who'd be first choice essentially and go? OK, it's, it's not great. You'd obviously prefer to have all of your options available, but yeah. over the course of a campaign, this is going to happen and we're prepared for it. Yeah, I think we are prepared for it now. And, um, you know, we've played a number of friendly games. We spoke about this before over the last number of years and introduced different players and given them some minutes on the pitch and a taste of, of playing against higher opposition, you know. And just the quality we have now in the squad. And again, we spoke about it. We have so many players playing professionally now abroad. Our own league has improved here in Ireland. We have some great young players coming through. So I, I really do think there's great depth in the squad at the moment. And... You know, I, I, it's it's always going to be difficult when you're missing three or four starting 11 players. But, you know, I, I don't fear it now as much as I might have feared it in the past. So, like, that, that high that these Irish players have been on since since last week, like, from a coach's perspective, is it is it more difficult to get players down from a high and back to the level at which you need them for the, for the kickoff tonight? Or is that something you can kind of utilise and, and almost use to your advantage? I think we can use it to our advantage. I mean, if you look at the game last week, um, I suppose we all got it wrong in terms of what way we thought it might go initially. Um, I certainly thought Ireland would take the game to Finland. Um, but I think some nerves uh, were definitely evident in the game. Um, I think also we probably gave Finland too much respect. Um, and look, they are they they, they had been they're the second seed in the, in the in the group, and I suppose they probably maybe deserved that little bit of respect. Um, historically, but for me, uh, and I've said it all along, we, we're a better team than Finland and we've proven that now by beating them twice. So I was a little bit disappointed with the tactics in the first half, but I think we have to take into account that there was no doubt some nerves there as well. Um, I don't think we're going to have those nerves tonight. We've now gotten what we wanted all along. The target was second place in the group, at least, and we've gotten that. That's secured, regardless of what happens tonight. We're in the hat for that um, the draw uh, for the playoff draws on Friday. Um, but I think now the fact that we have that momentum, we've only lost once in, in this group. We've beaten that. Uh, we've proven now we can, to ourselves really more than anything, that we can beat that second seed home and away. Um, so I think the, the confidence that the players will take from that um, will be a huge advantage tonight. You know, and the, the poignant moment for me at the end of that game with everybody celebrating was the picture of Denise and uh, Katie embracing each other on the pitch. And that said for me, you know, those girls have been there for so long. I mean, K um, both of them uh, made their debut under myself, actually. But Denise has been on the team since 2011. I think Katie a couple of years after that. And they've been through the highs and the, the and more lows, probably in the, certainly in the earlier years, and the near misses and the hard luck stories. And, you know, they just got over the line and, and they were so elated from it. And I think they're a level-headed group. I think they'll take, you know, every bit of confidence from that now into the game tonight. I didn't realise um, it, it's a full 11 years. She's still only 28, Denise yeah. Sullivan. Yeah. So, like, yeah, you'd hope that this is her peak. She she just looks a class above everybody else when she's playing. 
She absolutely is. And she was on our very, um, our, our 2010 um, under 17 uh, World Cup team and our silver medal in Europe team herself, Megan Campbell, actually both of them, Kira Grant, who's also in the squad, the three of them were on that team. They won the silver medal against all the odds uh, under Noel King in Europe. They were the first team to beat Germany in the under 17 competition. It was the fourth year in its, um, of, of the competition and Germany had won it the previous three times. And we beat them with a, a stunning Megan Campbell goal in the semi-final. Unfortunately, lost on penalties in the final to Spain, but had that silver medal and qualified for the World Cup. And Denise was one of the, the main players at the time. Uh, Rihanna Jarrett actually was also in that squad. Um, but straight away, Denise and Megan, both of them, came up to the senior team. They were that good. Um, so it is that long. And, you know, Denise is just a world-class player. I said it the last day, and she is. You know, she can change things for us. Okay, she probably didn't have our best game the other night, but I think Finland realised that she's the danger, one of our danger players, or our most dangerous player, and they certainly nullified her. They had extra bodies around her every time she got on the ball midfield. Um, they had extra bodies around her, but I, it was interesting. I, I, I saw the stats there from the, um, the, the 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 sports scientists working with the team, and Denise, I think she ran something like twelve kilometers in the in the game, and two or three of those at high speed, you know. So I mean, she certainly got around the pitch. She might be on the ball, but she was everywhere trying to affect the game, you know. And, and she is a class act. That's really interesting to to hear that, and uh, you know, that's the type of level of commitment that you're going to get from. The, so it's not just that she has the quality; she also has the application. And eventually yeah. something's going to fall, like, you know, uh, one of those runs is going to end up, she's going to end up in space and all of a sudden we'll absolutely. score off the back of it. Yeah, absolutely. And she keeps trying, she keeps going, she keeps pushing and she's everywhere. And if you just watch her even in a game. And, you know, when we're under pressure in games, any games when we are defending and she's everywhere, like she's trying to affect the game. She's trying to win the ball back. She's covering for play, covering players. Um, she's trying to get on the ball She, you know make things happen she's just as I, I keep saying I can't say it enough like she is a world class player and I think if she was playing in England maybe it would be more prominent um, you know or because that league is now the, the, the top league and it's the most publicised league I suppose maybe the fact she's in the States you know, maybe we don't hear about it as much, or we do obviously here because we we know of her and we're listening out for it. But maybe you know the 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 people in in the press or the people around Europe, whatever, don't hear about it so much. But I mean, her her team have won the league in 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 um in the US for the last couple of years. I think she's been voted the most valuable player as well uh, on a couple of occasions over there. So you know, she just is a world class player. Yeah, Caroline is a nice place to live. That's the. <laughs> it has <laughs> certain has certain charms. Yeah, has some qualities. Rainy yeah, Manchester sure. or sunny, sunny Carolina. Um, Absolutely. Well, let's just talk about the role of Katie then, because there's been massive debate over the last eighteen months about you know can we get her more involved? She's so important to us. Can we just mm -hmm. play her in the middle of midfield? What can we do? Can, is she a number ten? Like I don't know. I I don't know. Did we get a, any of an answer? D did she end up on more ball like we would have liked? Uh, the other night or is this still a work in progress? Katie uh, yeah look, Katie's a very valuable player to us also and there's another world class player in my view um, she was didn't have her best game the other night I don't think again I, I think Finland had probably done their, their homework but I don't think we helped ourselves we didn't get on the ball enough in, in the first half you know we tend to go long with it anytime we had it we didn't look to build up and play through the thirds and get Katie on the ball um, maybe if she had been playing in the defence you know we might have seen her on the ball more but I think um, certainly from my point of view and I think there's many others agree uh, you know I think she we're, we're better using Katie higher up the pitch because she can, you know, cause trouble in the opponent's defence. You want to unleash her on in 1v1 duels with the opponent's full backs because she can take them on and or, or not and still whip in great crosses, you know. And, I mean, she just has a stunning left foot, you know, and, and she's such a short backswing as well when she's taking a shot or, you know, whipping in a cross. She can put it on, on, on a sixpence for um, one of our, our attackers. Um, so I certainly think she's better higher up the pitch, but she has shown she can absolutely do the job from further back. Um, it was just one of those uh, games the other night. Unfortunately, it didn't happen for her in the first half particularly. Um, and she probably, she just didn't have her best game, maybe in the green jersey. But look, she still worked really hard. She's still a great leader. She still inspires those around her, I think, and, and leads really very, very, very well from the front. So I was just interested listening to, to, to Louise Quinn there a while ago on the show talking to, to, to Ashling and, and like 
she was asked about the Slovakian strengths and, and maybe areas where they could hurt us and I think she talked about the pace and the, the fast transition of the Slovakian players uh, yeah. one word she mentioned as well that, that uh, struck me was, was physicality and you know I was listening to the, the commentary on the radio with Nathan and Emma Byrne last week of the uh, the Finland game and, and Emma was in that first half talking about the physicality of the Finnish players compared to the Irish players mm-hmm. it, like is that is that something that, that maybe isn't a massive concern like it's just a case of you know doubling down on the strength and conditioning or is that something that, that could be a, an issue for this Irish team going forward you know, it's something I think many other countries have over us, or, or they certainly had. It's improving now because we have more players playing in professional clubs. But, you know, even going back when I was with the team, play, opponent teams, opposition that we played, even teams maybe ranked below us where we were better, a better footballing team, they just seem to be physically stronger than us. And I think, you know, I was from various workshops or speaking to different people, you're trying to find out why. And, you know, I think it was that they were starting younger in those countries countries in terms of strength and conditioning you know they had it in the clubs they had it in their underage national teams where we didn't have it in any of our national teams at the time and even a key one something so small they did so much um, PE and physical education in school you know so this was something that that they were doing as kids from a very younger age they're building that physicality and they're building that strength and conditioning and it was something that we didn't have we've certainly caught up um, you know, we've gone a long way to addressing that in the last few years, but it's going to take a while and it takes a generation, really. It's something that players have to start off with, or young girls have to start off with from a very young age. Um, and then it's something that, you know, naturally evolves in them. So, um, yeah, it's it's something that we have had a challenge with, um, but our, our football has gotten us through over teams like that. Now, when we go back to Slovakia, they're definitely a, um, an improving football nation. And, you know, they they only narrowly lost to um, Sweden at home. I think it was 1-0. They lost 3-1 away to Sweden. They took points off Finland at home. They took points off us away. So they aren't any slouches. And when I saw them playing against us in Tala, I thought to myself, gosh, they really have improved because, again, they would have been in, in the last group that I managed with this uh, team, um, whatever, four or five years ago, they were in our group and we, we beat them quite comfortably, I think. But they've definitely improved. Technically, they've all improved. And as you say, physically, um, they just seem that movement, they have that mobility around the pitch. They just seem to be able to do it better than they were. So they're not going to be an easy team uh, to, to get the win off tonight. Um, they did cause all sorts of problems in Tala. Um, so we're really going to be have, have to be on our A game, I think, to win this game tonight. That's a um, really interesting point about the, the PE. Like it's something that comes up again and again and again mm-hmm. on the show whenever we talk to anybody yeah. who's, who's kind of involved in sport that like we still... We've, we've made a little bit of an effort we've put it on the curriculum and it's almost yeah. like oh well that's the job done now it's on the curriculum what yeah. more can we do as a country but actually like you still hear of PE classes being cancelled uh, if yes. something else needs to be made up that's the yeah. first thing to be sacrificed and it's also yeah. it's not really codified properly in primary schools no we're way behind in terms of PE in school compared to many European countries who really are and you're right it's sometimes at the whim of you know well is there something else on we need the hall for today or whatever it might be and it's it's you know it's just not implemented enough in my view in schools it should be it should be there should be a better structure around it but you know that's where it starts in many of these countries and, and they have the, these programs in school from a very early age and that's where that builds that strength and condition that movement that mobility and players that eventually then when they go into club structures they have it there also and then their academies and you know many of these countries are, are ahead of us in, in that part of the game and here's the thing it would actually benefit every single sport it wouldn't just be uh, yeah. you know like this is one thing that the IRFU the FAI the GA and the LGFA can all get in a room and go yeah we all agree with this actually so what? Yeah. how are we lobbying the government to make sure that we're producing better athletes for our clubs and like for our health system for sure you know. Yeah, well, exactly. The health system is a key one also, but you're right, every sport will benefit. You know, it's not just football, it's every single sport. Um, but I mean, also the health of of, uh, of young children and I suppose even just to get girls enjoying sport as well, you know, because we have a challenge there um, when you go outside the elite side of the game, you have a challenge there even keeping girls in sport in general terms. So it has huge advantages all around. Uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you about was just the, the perception of the team and their willingness to give of their time and to do extra interviews like it it was very noticeable after the game the other night that Mm -hmm. the players wanted to come out and talk they wanted to tell their stories they wanted to enjoy the moment and to share that moment 
with the fans, not just the ones who were in the stadium, but like by talking to the media and by being open about stuff. I do. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about this group and the journey they're taking women's sport on and not just the football team by being so open and being such great ambassadors. Yeah, they are. They're great ambassadors and they are very open and there's a huge connection with the fans, as I mentioned. Uh, and every one of them has their own story. And, you know, storytelling is a big part, really, of, of that engagement in women's sport and, and trying to make that connection with fans and trying to make that connection with pre the press over the years, you know, because in, in different sports, you know, the interest probably wasn't there, you know. Uh, but as the quality improves now in the sport and the players are still willing to share their story and, and their open books, you know, Know, and I, I, I think it's great and long may it continue because you see how close they are to the fans and, and the fans definitely pulled them through the other night you know the, the crowd really got behind them when things weren't going well so you know I love to see it I have to say I think the players are more than willing to continue to do that and you see it you see it everywhere in, in women's football it's not just in Ireland you see it in England you see it you saw it after the Euros you know I, I think it's a really vital part of our game so, like we we briefly mentioned Megan Campbell's throw-ins and long throw-ins uh, a little bit earlier, like mm -hmm. and and the Slovakian manager even asked about it, which was quite funny as well in his press conference. But like I'm thinking back to even Ashley earlier mentioned the game a couple of years ago where, where she, you know she basically contributed directly to a couple of goals for Ireland through those uh, uh, throw-ins. I remember a game as well. You were probably in charge yourself. It was probably around 2014 or so, the game against Germany. When Germany. I think we yeah. lost the game, but but I yeah. know a couple of the Irish goals came directly from a young, maybe 19 or 20 year old Megan Campbell's long yeah. throw-ins. So this this is yeah. like, and the obvious comparisons are to Rory to lap, but this is a weapon that you obviously utilised when you were Irish manager, and and still you know eight years on yeah. here we are still and yeah. rightly using it. Absolutely, we trained us, you know, and you're right. We scored. We frightened the life out of Germany in that that uh, World Cup campaign. Um, we took the lead one uh, through um, a fantastic throw in um, under the main stand by by Megan. Uh, put into the box and Louise Quinn got her head on it um, she frightened the life as I say out of Germany they equalised and managed to go 2-1 ahead it was a, that that game still you know rankles with me and I'm sure if you ask Emma Byrne about it she'll say the same you know I mean they, they scored a freak winner uh, wind assisted cross went in into the goal uh, the wind carried it in over Emma's head um, but the, we took they, they were 2-1 up and in the 89th minute we equalised with another uh, throw in from Megan Stephanie Roach this time got her head to it and it is such a weapon and they just couldn't deal with it and at the time they were at the top of their game um, they were European champions at the time I can't remember whether they went on to win it then the, then the next camp, in that campaign or not oh that was a World Cup campaign sorry but they were European champions and they, as I say they were at the top of their game but they just couldn't deal with it and we trained it and um we had different movement for it and Meg, Megan puts that ball in better than you can actually put a cross in because she keeps it so flat and it just flies like a, a, an Exocet missile, you know, and watching her the other night do it because she hasn't played a lot of football as we know and she hasn't been on the team for a couple of years and she, I, I was just thinking to myself, I wonder has she lost any, you know, distance in the throw because, you know, as we all get older, I suppose we lose different things, but oh my gosh, she still has the same power and, and direction in that throw and it was really such a, a weapon and I think it's something the girls will, if Megan is playing tonight, hopefully she is, can certainly be used. And I'm sure, again, to frighten the life of the Slovakians. It, just taking as well, um, Sue, about the, the fact that uh, for some reason the away form in this Irish team seems to be excellent in comparison to the home form. And we, we talk about the record home crowds and the yes. support they get at Tallis Stadium. And yet it's the, the Sweden and Finland games away that you think back to it as maybe the most impressive performances. Like, Is there something in that? Is there something that just on the road certain teams tend to get results sometimes? Yeah, you know, like, like we talk with the crowd at home, and they are great, and they, and they do help uh, get the the team over the line on a lot of to a lot of occasions. But it can build, bring some pressure as well, and maybe when things are not going well, you know, the players might go into themselves unwittingly. Um, but they have been really playing very well away from home. Um, what what's the reason for it? I'm not really sure. Um, but they will need another good performance tonight because, as we've said, Slovakia are da a dangerous opponent. Um, you know, they've not to lose we've nothing to lose which is good from our point of view as well like we can put the icing on the cake by avoiding that first round of playoffs tonight and getting ourselves into that second round and giving giving ourselves a really good opportunity of qualifying directly for the world cup or indeed through the interfed competition um you know so 
I think we'll, we might just get over the line tonight, maybe by the odd goal. Um, I think the pressure is off us now. We've gotten and we've achieved what we wanted to achieve. Um, I think, you know, from that point of view, we're not going to have any pressure. We should be able to play our football. We should be relaxed. We should be calm. Maybe that crowd and the expectation at home, well, on one hand, it definitely does help us. Maybe it, it weighs us down a little bit at times. Um, that won't be there tonight, obviously. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of those. It's a catch twenty two, really, the, the home. But we have played very very well away from home. So hopefully it continues tonight. Sue, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Enjoy the game. All right, guys. Take care. You too. Bye bye. Uh, Sue Ronan there, giving us her thoughts on the game uh, this evening. It's a five o'clock kickoff. We'll have live commentary for you from five o'clock on OTB Sports Radio and it's all in association with Sky proud partner and supporter of our women's national team out believe together and show your support as Ireland look to make history and reach their first ever World Cup so just uh, you can get it on the OTB Sports app click the radio button or you can also get it on uh, any of your smart speakers by just telling them to play OTB Sports Radio now um, at 840 John Duggan is with us John good morning to you Jaron Shane how we doing what's going on uh, I suppose what's worrying around my mind the propellers I suppose I'm mean, enjoying the start of the Premier League season. I think Erling Haaland is almost appointment viewing every single time Manchester City play. Marcus Rashford reappearing has been interesting. And Richarlison's tattoos are fantastic. <laughs> He's got Daffy Duck, Donald Duck, Wiley Coyote and Tasmanian Dust Devil on right, his Right, so just a Warner Brothers fan. Yeah, it's... Uh, just missing Animaniacs for the clean sweep. I um, don't really believe in tattoos, but if I was going to get tattoos, I would probably have something similar to that. You're not a tattoo kind of guy, John, are you? No, no. Yes. What um, this is an interesting clash of cultures here. I've just realised. So, what what do you what do you mean when you say I don't really believe in tattoos? <laughs> I don't believe in um, ink in the body. I think the only jewellery you should probably wear is a watch or a wedding ring. I believe, on the other hand, my my body is a canvas, <laughs> an, an, an open art form that I can utilise until the day I die, and be, I'll be that old grey wrinkly leather skinned old man covered in <laughs> covered in the most random tattoos you can possibly think of what do you have Shane I've got, I've got I think it's 11 or 12 wow tattoos and all anything uh, th- like I've obviously got I spoke about this at Electric Picnic and, and kind of highlighted it to a couple of hundred people in a in a tent uh, the North Monaghan telephone code 047 that is unique wrist, that is pretty which cool. is fairly unique what if um, they change it though would you see it will always have been the telephone code when I grew up. <laughs> when I grew up, the, uh, our phone number at home was 31206 and then they changed it to 0507 and then they changed 0507 to 089507 or something. And I, like, I couldn't remember it. Well, the, the Gen Zs will be getting the air code, the, the f- first three digits of the air code tattoo. But no, I have a lot of random ones. I've got um, the handwriting of the last man to walk on the moon. The guy who went, I interviewed Gene Cernan in 2013. When he passed away a week later, I got it done in 2017. So uh, yeah, I've got the moon on my ring finger as well. Um, married to the moon, so yeah, John. Go on, Hannah, boy. Go on, Hannah. I tell you what, John. Don't rule it out just yet. If Spurs win, if Spurs win a Champions League or something, you could mark it with a little permanent, permanent. That's a good idea, JD. <laughs> That's a good idea. Put it out there. You yeah, can pay yeah, it forward yeah. like the secret. I've never Commit read it, to but it. I presume it's something it. like yeah. this for you. Like, yeah. Or will I maybe have the back of my neck virtual insanity? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Change the subject there, John. You're very, very yeah, deli- yeah. Uh, delicately deft, done. Deft. Yeah. Uh, any Man United, Shane? Uh, no Man United tattoos yet, but uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. What was your first one? First one was I went, was on the J one. This is obviously the start of a great story. But uh, we were in South Carolina, and we got the a few of us got the flag of South Carolina tattooed. I got it on my ankle, like near my ankle. So it's like a palm tree and the moon. And I was like, oh, that looks, that looks pretty nice. So um, I said, you know what? Let's let's go for it. I've started, so I'll finish. Yeah, exactly. I've got even when I was in Texas doing the the space documentary, I got the Lone Star of Texas. Um, brought a can of Lone Star beer which was famous from True Detective. Anyone who's seen True Detective knows the Rust Cole character played by Matthew McConaughey. He sits there drinking the, the cans of uh, Lone he Star says Beer. the time is a flat circle thing. Exactly. Yeah, so okay. I brought a can of Lone Star Beer into the tattoo parlour in Austin and, and told them, give me that exact star. Uh, so yeah, I've got a lot of random ones uh, and I think I probably would continue to get some extremely random ones. Uh, sure. And you're not stopping? Not going to stop. No, might as well. I, I, I might think, start. I'm, I'm, I, I, I've had this conversation on air with... Um, Kevin Kilban before he's like oh, it's not for us is it and I'm, I'm, I'm changing my mind right once you get one though then that's the re it, it's addictive you, I, I always said I'm never going to be a tattoo person I'm never going to get one got the first one and I was like oh, actually do you know what and uh, just as a matter of interest what did the folks say yeah that was uh, that was the awkward conversation when I came home mum just mum just shook her head 
She was like, you know what? <laughs> he's old enough now to make his own mistakes. Let him do it. So uh, she let me off. But uh, yeah, and then the rest of them, she didn't care. I think it's the first one. The first one that you have to have that conversation where you're like, got to Or you to. just don't, you just say like, you know, they're never going to see it. But see, I, I came back from the J1 in South Carolina with a tattoo, with my head kind of shaved um, and with a massive, massive beard. Right. So that the, 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 the parents, dad and my sister met me in the airport and they were like, who is this guy? I yeah, mean, I think everybody comes back from there uh, from that like a little bit, a little bit changed. Changed utterly, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't rule out the tattoos, lads. I think you'll 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 enjoy them once you get one. Yeah. Uh, so obviously we've spoken about the women's game. Five o'clock kick off Irish time uh, <laughs> this evening. Segway. Uh, a first Champions League uh, group stage evening uh, and a first match in that stage of the competition for five years for Celtic against Real Madrid. That'll be a brilliant atmosphere, as they call it, a paradise uh, in Glasgow tonight. Eight o'clock start. Same time for Manchester City against Sevilla. John Stones and Kyle Walker not available for City and 5.45 start for Chelsea in Zagreb against Dinamo. So, uh, you know, you wonder where City will rank in the, in the annals of football if they don't win this Champions League, but maybe Haaland might be the person to do it. Uh, yeah, like at the same time, um, was it David? Uh, was it who? Someone was over the summer giving out. We don't get any credit, you know. We never have enough players in the team of the year, and it's like, well, you know, if Pep wins the Champions League, having signed Erling Haaland, they're like, well done, congratulations, good man, <laughs> you're a great fella. <laughs> Rafa Nadal is out of the U.S. Open in New York, 22-time Grand Slam champion, beaten by. The American uh, Francis TFO, 12 years as junior in four sets. So now we have a situation that there's no previous Grand Slam winner left in the men's draw. It's really interesting. We're going to talk about this with Jenny Claffey in a few minutes' time, but um, there's like there's going to be a superstar born over the next week in, yeah. in the US Open. I, I, like, look, I don't know if everybody has Amazon Prime. Maybe more people have Amazon Prime than I think, do they? Mm. Not a lot of people seeing this, it seems. Yeah, yeah. You it's... have to go out of your way. That's the thing, isn't it, with Amazon Prime? You have to go out of your way. I don't like going out of my way. It's dodgy about this. <laughs> yeah. Carlos Alcaraz has beaten Marin Cilic, so I think he could be the guy, Carlos Alcaraz. I, I want to see them all now. You know, yeah. I want to see them all play each other. Yeah. Arne Savalenka beating Daniel Collins in three sets of the last 16 of the women's singles. And my mind obviously now turning my attention in the uh, cavern or the cave or the Batman cave I'll be in later on today for Virtual Insanity. BMW PJ Championship Edition starts on Thursday in the really big tournament at Wentworth with uh, all the live villains uh, in situ. You're having a, a bit of fun on, on Twitter. Not fun, John, but uh, I know Twitter is a, is a cesspit and a place where lovely things are said about everyone. But um, you just you, you just said that you missed the... Basically, missed, you missed the inter-county season. Yeah. That was all you said. That's all I said. And You got a little bit of feedback. I, I always get it from club people. Like the, 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 There's almost like... How, saying that I miss the inter-county GA season is almost like seen as an assault in the club game, but it's not. Mm. I just miss the inter-county season. That's all. <laughs> and so I have to then, you know fight my corner if people are going to have a go you know so I have to say like there is there is a lot of excitement around the club even when I was I was up, up back home in Monaghan at the weekend and you're talking to people and you're meeting people from like my own local club man and Harps lost at the weekend in the intermediate championship and everyone's talking about it did you see the game and I met my cousin who's from True and they drew in the senior championship within a ski and everyone's talking about that and then Scotstown are talking about oh Darren Hughes had a great game at the weekend there is there is a lot of love for the for the club game and, and there are stories there look this isn't a mea culpa but maybe people in the media ourselves everyone is is guilty of maybe not focusing on some of the great stories in the club game as maybe rigorously as we should because they're there um and you know we don't have the sunday game for the club which is you know again people don't see these games unless they go out and enjoy them for themselves but there I'm, are all, stories I'm all there. for amplifying it i'm all for amplifying it but i do think there's also the onus on just because your your team is not in a club final go to the club final the attendance is a club final have been paltry for 20, 30 years. I think the last, the record attendance was in 1999 for a club final. So... Oh, well, and do you know roughly what it was? I think it was about 40,000. All right, that's a, mm. that's a big now, number. But, but it's, I think the average has been, it was an Irish Times article Sean Moran, I think, did a couple of years ago, and it's about, the average is around 20,000 for club finals. It should be 80,000. It's all promotion. Like, AIB have done fantastic things for, for the club game in this country, similar to how, how Sky have done great things for the, for the women's team, and it, that is probably the, the crux of it. it. We need to just keep pushing it probably talking more about the it. standard as well you know the standard you know could be better at times as well so look uh you love to see it have mass appeal and that's all i'm missing is mass appeal you know these major days like they had in july and they all just came too quickly for me and 
I, I just like looking through Sunday uh, where there was club action on. It's, it's just difficult to kind of zone in and make it a big thing if it's if it's just like limited to a county. But like really, the the, the only game in town on on Sunday was soccer. The only game in town this evening is soccer, and the US Open at the moment. You know? We can't forget that it's that the club is the lifeblood. Of course, like, it, I, it, I understand it, all that. And and like even I was just even thinking recently about you know the whole when you're seeing the photos from Clonaldi Ross Moore for Dylan Quirk's funeral and you're seeing the club mates and the jersey and you forget that look he's an intercounty hurler but at the heart of it all he started with this club and even I, I was reading a book recently uh, Ogie Duffy Brendan Ogie Duffy the late um, former Monaghan minor captain his father Brendan has, has released a book recently a most Dogi in, in remembrance of him a life story and the story of, of his passing and, and like I think back to, to our own club Monaghan Harps and, and it, that's probably only what it struck me really what the club means to people is that you know, ourselves and, and Ogie's other teammates were the people in the in the house with his body the night before his funeral. Uh, some la- some of his teammates were, were the people who carried his coffin into the into the church and, and to his final resting place as well. And that was the point where I realised, Jesus, club is club is everything, you know? Because obviously his county teammates were there as well, but at the end of the day it's 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 the club lads, it's your it's your best mates, it's your neighbours, um, who mean everything, you know. So I, cl- the club game we probably should and could give more love to do you um, think it's it's possible to capture that talking about these games because the, the games almost seem not irrelevant to that in a way do you know what I mean like what yeah. you're what you're talking about is this, this incredible thing. strength of community and a tie that binds a group together and the games are a celebration of that mm. but in a way almost by like saying these games are the most important thing of all time it, it kind of undermines the fact that uh, these people are, they have a shared tradition and experience, which hopefully they're opening up to, to new people as well at the same time. So I'm definitely in two minds about this whole thing because I, I, I think yeah. that mostly we would watch two flies climbing up a wall if we thought the two flies were of similar standards. Uh, and and that's the kind of level of interest we have in sport in this country. Um, but it's just hard to find, like it's amazing to me how few people show up. Like next weekend, it's going to be Conor Callahan. It, it, they're playing Croaks, are they? Is it? Is it? Am I right? It's yeah, cool, yeah. Croaks. Um, or certainly they're against one of the other super teams, and it's going to be like some of the greatest athletes in the country at the moment up against each other, and there might be fifteen hundred people at it. It's it's weird, and I I don't know what you do to fix that. Yeah, I know, and it's yeah, it's Kilmacud, uh, Kula in the in, in the quarterfinals, but it, it like. Yeah, I think the quality the quality of club football has has improved dramatically. I think it has too. It's just um, you know not everywhere. I suppose. No, no. So you'll always have somebody really good against somebody not great. Yeah, one hundred percent. And you're going to have one sided games at club level as well. But I, I just think the the interest level is there at the base level. It the, people just need to get out and watch these games. And that, and yeah, and like I think John's point is fair that maybe people should show up to the All Ireland Club Final and make it a day like the All Ireland Final, even from a neutral perspective. I think it's definitely a, a job of work that can be done around that as well. Right, we will come back to that obviously because it's not going to go anywhere, and we have another couple of months of this to uh, talk about. OTBM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish your day. More from John tomorrow, and of course you'll catch him live every Saturday afternoon from one o'clock on Off the Ball on News Talk. Here's Craig Ray talking on Monday Night Rugby last night about South Africa's missed opportunity to destroy New Zealand. You don't often get the opportunity to beat the All Blacks twice in a row. And by leaving Marks out, by leaving Jasper Visser out and starting a, uh, Dwayne Vermeulen, who hadn't played for eight weeks, starting Joseph Dweber, who is very um, new to Test Rugby and is certainly not Malcolm Marks or Bongi or Benambi, you just gave the All Blacks uh, a finger. And if you give the All Blacks a finger, they'll take an arm. And uh, that's exactly what happened at Ellis Park. And that was very frustrating because that was a game, you know, the Springboks even fought back to lead 23-21 with nine minutes to go in that match. But uh, I think the toll it took on them, you know, tolled in the last six or seven minutes of that match. So there was a massive sense of frustration uh, that they didn't get the job done against the All Blacks. Adelaide, well, you know, Australia is just a funny place. Again, he left Marks and Jasper Visa out the side. But even so, the Springboks probably did enough to win that game in terms of creating chances, but they were just not good enough to execute. Um, so that then ramped up the pressure because now they've suddenly lost three out of six tests in, in the calendar year and it's not looking good. And you could certainly say that two of them, the Wales second test and the third test against uh, the, the, the second All Black test, were of the Springboks' own making in the sense that they were tinkering with a side where they didn't need to, um, other than for more long-term objectives, which is a bit of a bugbear of mine because it seems like everything can be excused at the altar of World Cup growth. And um, I just don't feel that that's right in an all-black test.
Right, Jenny Claffey's with us. We're talking tennis. It's 8.54. Um, so, Alcaraz has beaten Chilich, and he has the highest seed left because the first and second seed are gone. That means Nadal is out. What happened? That, that men's side of the of the draw is very open now. Um, Nadal last night was beaten by a very good TFO, but Nadal was nowhere near his best at all. He was beaten in four sets, very convincingly. Um, he had been complaining about the pain that he'd been suffering all year and how this was kind of, it felt like it was coming to an end. Is this the last time we're going to see Nadal in the US Open, do you think? I don't think so, no. no. He even said it yesterday after the match. He was like, see you next year. He was very sure about that. He's had a lot of ailments and injuries this year, do you know, and he was saying um, in his post-match conference, press conference that uh, he was training very well and felt really good on the practice court but just wasn't converting it onto the match court. So you could see in the early rounds he wasn't he wasn't Nadal at his best and, and it showed last night when he was beaten. Um, tell us about TFO. Should we expect him to be competing at this level? Is this something that has he's been building towards or is this a bit of a shock? He's, it is a bit of an upset, yeah, but he, he said, coming into the tournament, he was saying oh, he's going to go far in this tournament. I mean, it's his home slam, the US Open, but th- that comes with Typically a Typically understated American tennis player, yeah. Yeah, there's a good few of those, yeah. Um, but he's that kind of player that we've seen the last years. He's only 24, so he's still quite young, but he's that kind of player, like, he's fun to watch, he's explosive, he's really quick around the court, but he just hasn't been able to back up his wins, you know, he hasn't had that consistent form, so it'll be interesting to see, will he back up such a big win like this? I mean, this is t- going to take a huge emotional toll on him um, and yeah we'll see can he, can he back up that form It's funny I was listening to, to TFO speaking after the, after the match like, and he, some of the quotes from him were great like he was saying he was talking about getting to the quarterfinals of the Australian in 2019 but couldn't really push on and he was saying honestly when I first came on the scene I wasn't ready for it mentally and mature enough talked then about his, his team around him now it's kind of a similar to Nick Kyrgios in some ways that he talks about the team around him and how that has really really helped him like it's, a, it's an interesting it highlights the importance of the people around you as a tennis player at the top level. Absolutely, and you can see that with the likes, as you mentioned, Kiras there, he doesn't have a coach, so that has to be impacting him, although he's having some super form at the moment. With TFO, yeah, he's changed his coach. He brought on a guy called Wayne Ferrer, who was a pro himself um, earlier this year, and that's made a difference. He's had some good results this, this season. So I think he's changed the way he's been training um, physically as well, so he's looking really fit and lean at the moment. So, you know, who, who knows what could happen? Hopefully that that's a sign of good things to come. But in the recent years, yeah, he, has, he hasn't been able to back it up but let's see what, what's going to happen So we know the quarterfinal make up of the men's on one side of the draw it's Rod and Berrettini will play the winner of Kyrgios and Kashinov Yeah Kashinov yeah, yeah. Ka- Kashinov yeah. um, So I like I don't know this is one of those things where Kyrgios beats the number one seed and then goes out to the number 27 seed is that possible? Like probably isn't is it? Um, well anything is possible if you look at the, the men's draw like there's no no Djokovic no Nadal and the number one and two seeds are gone now so it's left the, the the draw wide open and lots of opportunity but that also comes with pressure so now Kyrgios probably feels okay Nadal's gone that, you know he, this is his chance and can he ma- match that and, and you know keep play under such pressure but he could he could lose but at the same time I, I feel like he's on a good run of form um, and this could be his title. If Rodin Berrettini are on in the semi-finals if he wins his quarter-final and he'd be favourites for that for the quarter-final which of Berrettini and Rod would cause him the most difficulties? I think Berrettini. I think Berrettini will come through that match. I'd say it'll be a tight game, but I'd say that would be Berrettini. He'll win that. Uh, he's just a big server. He's playing very well on the hard courts this season. Um, yeah, he's been in a Wimbledon final last year, Berrettini, so he's had that experience. So I think he will challenge Nick. He probably won't falter to his, you know, the carry on that Nick often. Yeah. yeah. But I still think Nick has got the game to beat him. He's just playing so well at the moment. It's funny. Like I was watching that, that Kyrgios Medvedev match on Sunday, and, and like it, it, the, the first set tie break seems so important and I think Kyrgios even mentioned it after the match he said honestly if he had won that tie break I don't think I could have had the mental fortitude to go on and, and do it like you forget in a, in, a, in a game of such intensity how important it is to not go through that draining first set and, and be on the wrong side of a tie break yeah Kyrgios yeah, he did say that he was saying like it was 13-11 it was in the tie break in the first set which is just that's unheard of like you know first to seven and it's 13-11 yeah and he mentioned that he didn't think it, things could have been very different but he had a bit of momentum then but he, going into the second set he lost that second set very easy like 6-1 or 6-2 and then was able to turn it around which we haven't seen in, in Kyrgios's games you know sometimes when he gets down himself that's, that's it, it he's gone yeah. yeah so it was great to see that he was able to t- 
have that mental strength and turn it around. And he's just playing like his serve is bombing his, bombing his serves down. He's returning really well. You know, he's just looking very sharp and he won a title there um, just coming into the US Open, his first title in three years. So, you know, he's got a bit of confidence and a bit of belief in himself, which is kind of scary, you know, the Nick Kyrgios playing with confidence. On the other side of the draw, uh, it's Alcaraz versus Sinner and Rublev versus TFO. Um, Alcaraz obviously at the start of the year we were like chalking him in for 15 to 20 grand slams <laughs> yes. he's in the Nadal and then Wimbledon came along and he just crapped out basically like, yeah. so he, that might not be his surface but this is his surface right? Yeah so he came to shine last year in the US Open that's when we really kind of heard about him um, and the ability that he has We, as you said we, we saw it at the start of the year and then Wimbledon I think the grass just didn't suit him at all uh, because he's an incredible mover he just wasn't able to transfer that onto the surface on grass but I think he's going to come through on that bottom half I mean it'll be very exciting he's also playing for the world number one ranking as well so if he can come through and win this he could, he'll be the new number one men's tennis player like Alcaraz versus Kyrgios in the final could be sensational that would be a spicy game <laughs> that would be really exciting to see you've got a, t- a tale of two different very different players you know but it'd be a very box office game like you'd want to get the popcorn out for that is there a feeling that if Kyrgios was to get one grand slam that actually like I, I, you know, it sounds ridiculous. He's he's here, but he's definitely not applied himself. He hasn't played a full schedule any of the last few years. He's talked about like not loving the sport a bit, like Ronnie O'Sullivan. You know, kind of mm. has has had a break. Is there a possibility that if he was to win, that something releases in him and he's like, actually, you know, this is where I'm supposed to be, and then he becomes like, and I'm not saying long term because obviously he's he's not young but that he could have a couple of years where we expect him to be in semi-finals and finals. Well, the sense you get from him is that if he won a Grand Slam that he would retire almost. There's, mm-hmm. there's that feeling as well. You know, he said there that after the, the big game against Medvedev that, you know, there's only three more matches left and then I can retire. Right. Do you know, I mean, there is that kind of sense of unpredictability about Nick Kyrgios in every way. Does he mean it like Tyson Fury where it's like, I'm not really retiring, I just want more attention? Or do you think he actually means it? <laughs> I, I, it's hard to know what he I, means. I honestly think there's a bit of a, the, the Nico Rosberg and. 2016 when he beat uh, Lewis Hamilton in the Formula 1 won his world championship and at the prime of his career decided that's me I've won my world title I think Kyrgios could do the could do the same there was the bizarre moment in the in the Medvedev match as well uh, you, a lot of people have seen the clip on Twitter where yeah. the ball the volley is obviously landing on Medvedev's, Medvedev's <laughs> side of the net and Kyrgios comes around and fouls it I mean you, you just don't know what to expect the rule what, how, how, uh, it doesn't, still doesn't make any sense to me like he's hit the ball before it's bounced so you're not allowed to, by rule, you're not allowed to hit the ball over the other side of the okay. net. Okay. But it's unbelievable how he did make that mistake. Um, and, and first thing he said after the game was like, he looks like a fool. And I think it's probably safe to say he does. But mistakes happen in the heat of ballot battle. I know? honestly thought because of the character of Kyrgios immediately, I thought he's just doing this for the laugh. Yeah. Yeah, in terms, but, but obviously it was a mistake. But when you actually see it, you're like, did he, he was on, he was like right in front of Medvedev almost hitting the shot. Like that's... <laughs> As we know, there is one exception to that rule that if the player on the other side hits the shot with backspin, it bounces over on your side and then bounces back, then you can reach and and hit the ball on the other side. Um, One of the things that like our very uh, Wimbledon-centric view of the world has resulted in is that we are like, oh, the US Open, it's kind of, it's the end of the year. But actually, if you win the US Open, it's life-changing. Like, you become this absolutely massive superstar, as we saw with uh, Emma Adekano last year. So if Kyrgios was to win this, he crosses over into like a uh, proper celebrity in America style and like for the rest of them, like if, if Alcaraz wins this, it's the first of a series of Grand Slams that he's going to win because we, we do feel like he is the game to mm. become super dominant over the next few years. But, um, you know, for Kyrgios, there will be like other stuff. He will be on Saturday Night Live. He will be on all of the talk shows like they will start lapping that up, you know. Yeah. But I do wonder if he's ready for that. Well, he is the showman. You know, I think that he likes that attention that he gets. You know, a lot of that negative attention he gets, he thrives on that. I mean, look at the way he goes on on the court. He's very negative. He's unlike anybody else. But that's what works for him. So I think he would actually enjoy the limelight. And also after the US Open, there's a little bit of a break. So he will get a bit of downtime and time to, you know, obviously get used to that fame. And then we would see an interesting, would he train in the off season and get back for the hard court season in winter? Or would he leave it to the Australian Open? But I think, he, I think he'd be ready for that fame. I mean, he's, he's got so much fame for the wrong reasons. It would be nice to see, you know, him in the limelight for his tennis because he's finally actually showcasing how good he is now in New York. So that's what we would like to happen. What do you think will happen? What's your predicted final? If he wins. Or like, it, what do you think is actually going to happen? In the men's final. Yeah, in the men's. Well, I'd like to see a Kyrgios-Alcaraz final. Okay, so you yeah. think it, do you think it'll happen? 
It definitely can. Yeah, I think Alcaraz it started turning. I thought Alcaraz was going to was going to challenge Nadal. Okay. Nadal's gone now, so I think Alcaraz could come through in the bottom half. And then yeah, I think um, Kyrgios would beat Bertini if they both get to the semis. So I think it would be. A- can I just ask you um, before we leave the men's draw, Jenny? Just on, and I'm bringing it back to Nadal here briefly, but. It, it was, I heard during commentary as well that they were talking about Nadal changing his ball toss in order to help prevent the back injury from kind of flaring up again. Like how, for a tennis player, how significant a thing is that? Like it, it seems marginal for, for us amateurs who barely pick up rackets, but mm. changing your ball toss must must have very significant repercussions for your game. Yes, yeah, so the, looking at the stats on that, actually the speed of his serve hadn't slowed down that much, maybe by two kilometres or something. So it wasn't a huge difference. He just altered the toss, obviously, then to prevent aggravating the abdominal. So it was just a measure to try to alleviate any kind of pains but it didn't actually impact his serve it looked like it had but but looking at stats the speed hadn't actually changed that much uh, would it put you off would it make you feel less in rhythm like yeah of course yeah because you're used to playing one way and then you're having to alter but I mean it didn't look to I don't think that was the reason why he lost you know um but the, the signs were there like even in the the Fognini match was it in the second round he, he looked a bit I don't know if nervy is the right word to use, but he didn't look like the Nadal. Do you know, I'm just saying that the, the defeat probably wasn't a complete surprise given he, he didn't look the, the Rafa Nadal we know and love in, in the early rounds in, in Flushing Meadows. Yeah, the first few rounds he really wasn't playing the way he can, like with that sheer confidence and the way he moves around the court. He wasn't moving as well as he normally does, which is a huge, um, like, a part of his game like he's able to cover the court so well his shots weren't penetrating through the, sh- the court at all you could see that last night against TFO and um, TFO was stepping into the court and taking the ball very early which n- a lot of players when you play against now they're da- back in the back fence and you're trying to defend so the ball wasn't kicking up off the court as, as much as it does that might be the, the stomach muscle might be a, a factor in that um, but just the way TFO played against him was really obviously very good, but Nadal wasn't himself last night at all. Um, but as you said, though, the stomach issue and the serve toss and everything, if your serve goes the rest of your game, you lose a bit of confidence in the rest of your game generally. Cause if the first thing that goes is your serve, you know, you're trying to start off the point of serve, you're not winning cheap points on it, whatnot, then that can impact your confidence in the rest of your game. But he, this is Nadal, he's, you know, 22 grand slams. It's, it's hard to put it down to just that. He's 36 now, right? Do, do, we think that he can win more Grand Slams at this stage or is this was what's happening here kind of what happened a bit with Serena where the injuries made her human and everybody started to think well actually I don't need to be beaten before I go on the court and so even the, the matches she was winning were much longer and it was taking more out of her and so eventually the, the accumulation of a million different things is the thing that gets somebody as they age out it's, it's not just like oh the serve is gone or the injuries happened it's like actually everything else that goes with that yeah, with Nadal, it's it's hard to to rule him out. I think this stage, you know, he obviously has had a few more injuries this year than than previous seasons. That obviously might be the age, as you said, thirty six. But I think he still has another French Open in him next year. I don't th- think this is the end of him. You know, if you look at his year this year, he won the Australian Open, he won the French Open, he was in the semi final of Wimbledon. This is his first loss, actual loss in a Grand Slam this year, which is unbelievable. So I'm not sure if if. The age, well the age is obviously impacting the injuries and whatnot, but I don't think this is the end for him I do think he's going to have another season in him he might take a little bit more time off now to rest and recuperate and rehab any of the injuries and then come back at the start of next year yeah so maybe we won't see him again trying to win is it still the ATP the Masters, Masters course, yeah, yeah. The, the end of the 1000 yeah those tournaments and then the, the year end tournament I don't think we'll see him at the yeah like okay that. fair enough uh, let's talk about um, the women's and we haven't I don't think had, I certainly haven't spoken to you since the um, the Serena end Right. Was it a fitting end in the end, like a kind of farewell? It was a disappointing end, I think. You know, coming into the US Open, it would have been amazing to see her going deep in the tournament, but she just didn't have the match play and the practice in her, you know, coming into it. Um, the way the, 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 they gave her a lovely um, celebration after the first round uh, win that she had and then she had a tough second round win against the number two seed and then there was a bit of hope there maybe you know she knocked out the number two seed could this be it into the third, third round and then she just wasn't uh, herself in that match and Tom Janovic the, the player who beat her was so good and so clinical against her um, so it was kind of a bit of a disappointing way to see her going in the third round the US Open it wasn't quite the swan song we were not into week for. two no um, Tom Janovic is still going and looks to be 
dangerous at this stage for um, anybody that she's coming up against. So she's up against Anjou Burr. Yeah. yeah, so there's, there hasn't been much chat about... Your old Jib- friend, isn't it, Anjou Yeah, Jib- 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 my rival, huh? <laughs> <laughs> there, there hasn't been much chat about Jib- in this tournament at all compared to, say, Wimbledon. There was obviously high expectations she made the final. Um, but Tamlianovic, that'll be a, a good game against Jib- today. Tamlianovic is obviously coming in on great form. Now she's beaten Williams. She then backed it up with a very convincing win against Samsonova. Um, she's hitting her backhand very well so it'll be interesting to see her playing against Jabir who plays a, a different kind of a game who mixes up the ball a little bit more so we'll see can Tom Janovic dictate and, and get, get in on top of her I think Jabir has a little bit more experience at this level um, and I think that she's going to come through on that one Obviously Go on No I was just going to say like, you, you talk about uh, you know someone winning and, and changing their lives massively like Coco Goff if someone immediately comes to mind as like <laughs> a you know 12th seed she hasn't dropped a set yet I think in, in, in this year's tournament Caroline Garcia, the French woman, next for her. Like, there's so much pressure on Coco Goff's young shoulders, but she seems to take it in her stride. She is looking scary this tournament. I think there's just something different about Goff in this tournament. Just she has a steely look about her. She's just so mentally tough. At 18, she's so young, you know. And as you said she hasn't dropped a set in the tournament so far. She's looking really dominant. Um, Garcia though is a player who's who who's uh, playing very well at the moment, and she won a tournament on the way into the U.S. Open as well. So she's obviously got some form. Um, Andy Murray said about her like 10 years ago about Garcia. He's like she's going to be the next number one in the world. She hasn't obviously gotten there yet and that was 10 years ago but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I thought that when they said that they were t- he was talking about Goff but um, I think Goff will come through on that match I think Goff is going to this could be a ch- an opportunity for her in the US Open I know she's on the same half as um, Svantec but I just think there's something different about her in this tournament she's just got this as I said that steely look in her eyes and she's playing so well she's serving well she's dominating her opponents she's all over it like she's so confident it's amazing to see so this could be her It could be like Sharapova age 17 winning Wimbledon levels of madness if, if Goff won Yeah oh, this, the, the, they'd go mad in the States if she was to win like at 18 you know then She's so young. She has a lot of potential, though. I think she's going to be someone where a star of the future, um, definitely in the women's game. It feels a little bit like the women's game is on the verge of um, that yeah. type of like superstar. Yeah, we're waiting for it on the women's side. I mean, there was Osaka there, uh, you know, in the last few years who we thought was going to be the next thi- big, big player. Well, she still is, obviously. She's just had a few injuries. But Goff is, I mean, we've been talking about her for, for the last three years since she shot onto the scene beating Williams in Wimbledon when she was only 15. So, I mean, the, the way that her team have managed her has been amazing. Like, they've really kept her away from the limelight. and um, So she hasn't had been exposed too much I think to the pressures the external pressures that comes with being um, such a star and I think the American media are quite good at like kind of letting her do her thing unlike the British media unlike Radicanu well that's the the obvious comparison here right yeah Um, but like they're the same age I think maybe Radicanu is a year older but the difference in their paths have, have been have been just astronomical like you know Radicanu shot to fame winning the the US Open last year and just hasn't been able to perform and back it up at all and then she's obviously had the issues off court and her team isn't settled whereas if you look at Goff she hasn't quite had the results case she got to the French, the French Open final this year we've been talking about her but there isn't that same pressure on her from the media so I think that Goff has got the upper hand advantage there on that one Schwantek's only 21 as well yeah, she again. We've talking about her this year with her amazing run of form, world number one. Only twenty one. He said, "There's so much time left for these players, you know, because you're only really coming into your form as an athlete in your later twenties. So, and these guys are so young. Um, but Shiontek has stepped into that number one role quite well. She didn't have the best uh, Harcourt season coming into the U.S. Open, so maybe she's lacking a little bit of confidence coming into the U.S. Open. But she's looked good so far. She had a good comeback um, yesterday in her match. She was she lost the first set and then demolished her opponent." six love in the third set so she's been in this position again as we said she's got the experience she's won a Grand Slam so it'll be exciting to see I'm, I'm not actually disappointed by what happened um, with the level of expectation there was heading into Wimbledon and the record that she was protecting but once that record has gone sometimes there's a relief and a release into like okay that's I'm not protecting that anymore but she hasn't been in great form is that what you're saying? Yeah she hasn't had the, the best results since but I think she's playing now with a little less pressure as you said like that is huge you know, 37 match wins everybody was talking about it the world, new world number one and then now she come, she's coming into this US Open and she's just playing, she's playing quietly confident, I think, but playing with a little less pressure, which is nice to see. OK, uh, call the women's for us then. It's much trickier. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Goff. 
I want to say Shondek, but Shondek's my second choice. But uh, I'm going to say Goff on the women's side. She's got to beat Shondek in the final. She, there's, there's same side. Okay, yeah. So they're going to meet in the semis. In the semis. The winner of that, I think, is going to win the tournament. Goff and Kyrgios double there. I love it. Amazing. So New York is going to crown two new champions on both the men's and women's side. So it'll be exciting for the, the future of the tennis game. Yeah, well, uh, that's the thing about the US Open. We were just saying earlier on that I'm not sure everybody's watching this because it's on Amazon Prime, but it's um, not too late to, like, they have free weeks, don't they? You yeah, they free, week, free weeks or something, yeah. There you go. That's uh, It's absolutely worth it. Um, right, Jenny, thanks very much. Thank you for having me, guys. Uh, looking forward to seeing exactly what happens over the course of the rest of the week. It's 9.14 this morning. OTB AM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs. <clears throat> Pardon me for an effort that's finished your day. OTB Gold. At one o'clock today is the life and times of Johnny Kilban. Dadcast at three. Kilbeer, a career retrospective is Ronnie Whelan at four. And then, as we've been saying all day, live commentary of Slovakia against the Republic of Ireland from five o'clock. Make sure you get the OTB Sports app. That's the easiest way to listen to the show from five tonight for the live commentary of that. We're back after the break talking rugby with Matt Williams. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Man City lose Kira Walsh, they're not competing. Did get yellow carded very early on in the match for being a bit too eager coming out of her goal and taking out, I think it was Leah Carlton, but... Uh... <laughs> Subscribe to the OTB Koyig pod on the OTB Sports app now. If your business relies on a van, that wouldn't sound good. But this does. Get up to 75% off van insurance. Now available in FPD branches nationwide. FPD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. 75% no claims discount based on five years claims free. Available on new van policies. Used for farm or business purposes. Terms and conditions apply. Underwritten by FPD Insurance PLC. FPD Insurance Group Limited trading as FPD Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM. With Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Right, the Premier League is back. We've teamed up with one of Europe's largest sports events, ticketing and hospitality companies, Champions Travel, to give you the opportunity to win a €250 Euro Champions Travel voucher every day this week. They can be used on Premier League match trips as well as a host of other sporting events. Daily winners will also be entered into a grand prize draw where one lucky winner will win a trip from a selection of Premier League games with flights and two nights accommodation included to enter. Just tell us who this man is giving us his best Liz Truss impression. Crimes and wars will multiply. I love football. I mean, it seems to have been uh, factually correct. Who was that? Uh, let's hear it again. Crimes and wars will multiply. You can uh, tweet us I your guess. I love guests. football. You can tweet us your guess on our main Twitter account, which is at off the ball. Uh, now, we're turning to rugby at 9.16 this morning. I'm delighted to say Matt Williams is with us. Matt, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, Joe. Very good, mate. Um, we should we should start by talking about Australia. Like, I, um, <clears throat> from talking to you over the last number of weeks and the the level of injury difficulties that the team has suffered, uh, was the weekend more in keeping with what we expected to happen? Was there almost an understanding about why South Africa were able to beat them the second time around? Um, or am I making excuses? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, uh, look, South Africa. Should have should have played a lot better in Adelaide, and they didn't. Uh, and South Africa played with incredible physicality in Sydney. I think the very big disappointment um, at the opening of the new stadiums, so that was the new Sydney Football Stadium, the first test match of the night before there'd been a game of rugby league, but this was really the big international opening of the stadium, uh, built on the same spot of, as the old stadium at the Sydney Cricket Ground, that precinct. I know many of your listeners would have visited there. Uh, so it was a huge night in Sydney and the Wallabies didn't fire a shot. Physically, they were very poor. Their kicking game was poor. They made huge mistakes. They were ill-disciplined uh, and they got a couple more injuries. So th- th- there's no excuses there for that. They-, they had played very, very poorly. Look, it was a poor match. 27 penalties absolutely played into the Springboks' hands. Heaps of stoppages, lots of penalties for them. The maul and scrummage and bore the socks off everyone. It was a very, very disappointing uh, spectacle uh, rather than just just a disappointing result for the Wallabies. Springboks thoroughly deserved their victory. They were far, far superior. But, gee, it was a poor game of rugby. One of the other things that um, we've been talking about since last week was the relatively funny exchange between the um, New Zealand coaching ticket and Michael Checker 
when the New Zealand coaching ticket were complaining about uh, not rolling away and slowing down of balls and Michael Cech is laughing going, well, you guys would know all about it, wouldn't you? And it did It did just start a conversation that we had the other day where it's like, um, it seems unless you're putting pressure on the referees at all times as an international coach, you're not actually doing a very important part of your job. You're not warning everybody about what the opposition is doing. And it's kind of grim enough because it feels a little bit like, you know, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. I'm like, well, are we really? Is that is that the situation we're in at the game where the international head coach's job now involves a 10-minute warning to the referee to make sure that the opposition's cheating is caught? Well, it, it's always done that, Jim. I mean, I, I think this is something... Oh, there's been a number of things this week where I think, again, just shows what the public don't know about international sport that is that has been the case since the game turned professional in in 1996 you always get 10 15 minutes half an hour with a referee before a game and you state your case you say this is what we're going to do and look this is what we've seen the opposition doing you're going to stop them that has always been the case and so that's when rassi erasmus came out last on the on the lines tour and uh made public his or, or someone made public his discussions with the referees everyone was up in arms and Nigel Owen said it, and I said, well, all the coaches said, that happens every week. So, no, I, I don't believe that that's like some sort of new um, in, uh, in, intervention in the game. What is a problem is that when you get within 10 metres of the try line, the defensive team just does anything to stop you scoring. And New Zealand have been in the past masters at that for many, many years, going back to Richie McCaw's time. They would cheat they're yeah, absolutely living socks off 10 metres from the try line to stop you scoring a try. And that's what Michael's saying. Like, you know, if New Zealand is complaining to the referee about about the, the dark arts at the breakdown, I mean, you know, really? <laughs> really? I mean, that's what Czech's saying. They're the best at it in the world. And they have been for many years. When Richie McCaw was playing, he was a genius. And, and I say that with great admiration for him. He was an incredible footballer. But, you know, that, that's what they've always done. The, the problem we face in rugby, as I said, I think I said on the show last week, is that the, you can't blame the coaches. The coaches are like uh, uh, tax uh, accountants. They find loopholes in the law. That's their job. That's what they're paid to do. Their, their job is to win on Saturday. That's it. Full stop. End of story. Nothing past that. So anything they can get away with, they will. And I've been there, and that's your, that's your gig, right? So let's not blame them. The, the problem sits with the lawmakers at, at World Rugby who, who have just done nothing for years and years, have seen how the coaches are exploiting these loopholes in the system, watching the refereeing at 27 penalties at the Sydney Football Stadium. There was a, an interview um, uh, done, I, I just can't remember which were the, the media organisations, and then people were walking out saying they're never going back. Rugby people to their to their heart uh, saying they're never going back to a test match. It's just, it's just not entertaining anymore. It's, it's, it's very boring and the game, you know, can't keep doing this. Now, I, I keep saying that, but the game does keep doing it and the, the uh, coaches keep finding more ways to waste time to keep the ball out of play and to um, play a game that suits their talents. Now, you've got to give the Kiwis credit. They played a really entertaining game. They're trying to play up, upbeat rugby, but then again, they're trying to stop the opposition with illegalities, as are all teams. And the second part of that is you've got some teams, especially the Springboks that are on show at the moment, and I put England in that same category, that are playing a very, very negative game plan that exploits the, all the loopholes in the laws where the ball is in play for very short periods of time, and it is absolutely boring. It wasn't just that, Matt, as well, in the game in Sydney at the weekend. like You had brawls breaking out, you had, uh, you know... Ill feeling, to say the least, between between the two teams as well. Look, very interested listening to Craig Ray, the South African rugby journalist, on, on Monday Night Rugby last night with Will, and he referenced the the Wallaby gamesmanship, and and you know he I think he referenced the Nick White incident in the first test, and is that something that that some teams might target Australia with that they might think right if this is a team that's going to get riled up, we're gonna we're gonna absolutely do our best to rile them up. Well, I, I actually thought that was the most entertaining part of the game, to be really honest with you. <laughs> it was great. Kieran, you used to sit next to the great Kieran Fitzgerald, captain of Ireland in the 80s when they, when they won the, the Five Nations as it was then. And I remember him watching a fight in the great South African test of the 1970s. He looked at me and said, oh, they were the days, Matt. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, Look, no one wants to see fights, but that's what happens. Everyone gets frustrated. And look, no, nothing really came of it. And they're not fights, they're just pushing and shoving mm. and people yelling at each other. It's not, not like 
not like Willie John McBride and the famous 99 call. That that doesn't happen anymore because you throw a punch and you're gone. And that's the way it should be. There's no two ways about that. Um, I agree with you. The Wallabies can get well. Look, uh, uh, there was uh, Swain, the uh, Wallaby second rower, had his hair pulled um, in the against England and he turned around and uh, head-butted the guy who pulled his hair. I mean, that's just ridiculous. You can't do that. He got sent off and cost his team the series. Um, look, th- there is no doubt the Springboks have always been physical and they bring this physicality uh, to every game they come to. And they, they were hurt after playing poorly in Adelaide. And, and again, you know, I've got to... I've got to say that South Africans blame everyone else when they lose and then take all the praise when they win. They played poorly in Adelaide. They missed kicks at goal. And Australia played really well. Australia laid on four very good tries. They're, they're, that's it. End of story. Uh, Faf de Klerk was unjustly sinned in. Nick White, as I wrote in the Irish Times last week, got the Greg Laganis Award for the worst dive in history. He should never have done it. It was embarrassing. It, it was embarrassing for the gold jersey, embarrassing for all Australian rugby. Now, that, that's no one in rugby condones diving. And the referee on the field should have told him to get up and stop being, being as I said in the paper, a pork chop, which Nigel Owens would have done and did do. Uh, unfortunately, the TMO and the referee got it horribly wrong. Factor clerk was sinbin, and it was an appalling uh, blight on, on rugby that that occurred. But that doesn't take away from the fact that Box played poorly in Adelaide and they played great in Sydney and they brought their physicality, which is what they do. They, they, their um, plan is really simple. They pick six forwards on their bench. They have a huge pack on the field and they are going to physically smash you up. They're going to be as close to offside as humanly possible in defence and the physicality they bring is huge at scrum time and every line out they will maul and they will kick to bring the physicality to the back three. Highly effective, uh, very smart, and very hard to stop, and exceptionally boring. All, all under the one sun. Look, I, look, the Wallabies are, to come back to the original question, the Wallabies are, are very weak. Australian rugby is at, a, at the weakest I've seen it since I was a little boy, since the 70s when they were, were really, really in trouble. And that is also linked to their financial troubles. In the 70s, they were bankrupt. Um, you, you might remember the Wallabies used to wear a very famous Adidas jersey through a long period of that. That was because they got to France, I think it was in 73, and they didn't have any gear. They literally didn't have a jersey or shorts. And the French who were sponsored by Adidas gave it to them. They organised them to have shirts and shorts and socks. That's the truth of that. how the Adidas started. Australian rugby financially is in the same position roughly now. The next World Cup in four years, they'll get out of it. Then they've got the Women's World Cup two years after that. So by 2030, Australian rugby will be back financially in the black. But between now and then, they're they're really on the ropes. There's not a lot of talent coming through, especially at nine and ten. And there's talent in certain areas, but they've also got a, a drain of talent going to France and uh, and Japan in particular from Australia because the money is so good. And they have a rule that if you go, unless you've played, I think it's 80 tests. They might have brought it down a bit now. It might be 60 tests. I just don't quote me on the 80. Unless you played 80 tests, it was used to be called the Matt Kiddo rule because he played 80 tests. We can bring you back in. So they, they do apply for exemptions every now and then in case they've got injuries. But there's a lot of good players playing overseas that, that aren't will never play for the Wallabies again. And they're not the force they were uh, at the turn of the century. And I can't see them coming back to that anytime soon. Can I ask you about something totally different here? There's um, various pieces about Malachi Fakatoa, who has obviously signed for Munster. He's tearing it up in pre-season, looks absolutely sensational. And fingers crossed he's going to be injury-free for the next while. But um, I think it's Derek Foley has written today that he's going to be playing against Ireland in the World Cup for Tonga. And it's just, um, I think Charles Pietau is going to be in that team. Israel Falau is, is eligible to play in that team as well. So their back line is going to be sensational and interesting. And it always really felt like... Um, you know, there was something not quite right about taking teenagers from one country, plunking them in your Europe in your school system, and then uh, not allowing them play for their home country. It, it feels like it's a bit rich from the Irish, who are you know have a lot of New Zealanders playing for them, but the New Zealanders who came here were grown men. You know, now we have started to pick up some Hawaiian props in in uh, their teenage years as well, and it just makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable that whole. You're 14, 15, we take you away from home, we play you for our country. It's great, I think, basically, is what I'm trying to say, that these, these lads will play 
for the country of their birth and the country that they're probably most happy playing for. I, I'm just interested in your take on that whole kind of the geopolitical part of that. It's exploitation, pure and simple. Dan Leo uh, is head of a players association representing the Pacific players, which is, is basically Tonga, Samoa, uh, uh, Fiji uh, and, and various islands across, across the South Pacific. There is no doubt Australia, New Zealand, France and to a lesser degree um, uh, uh, England exploit players. New Zealanders in particular, they're, they're basically schools turning up, they're offering scholarships, taking kids away from their families at 14, 13, 15, to, so they got the opportunity to win their first 15 comp and brag in their local area. It, it, it's an appalling um, system. Now, the, the opposition on that says they're providing uh, some young players with an education they wouldn't get in their home country. That I, You have to agree that is possibly the case. The, the schooling they go to, the education system they go to are very, very good and they get a, an opportunity for a for a work in academia and, and post rugby life that they may not get in their own country. So there's we've got to we've got to put the 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 um, the, the ways up in there for, for both sides of the argument. My problem is those guys never get they they go and play for Australia or they play for New Zealand and and a little bit more for France. It's happening more and more in France uh, where their centre deformations, their academies are bringing in young players from Pacifica, qualifying them as French players. And it's something called the GIF, which which basically means you are educated in the French system through a French academy. And once you've you've graduated from a French academy, you're regarded as a French player. And so there's loopholes in that system. And lots of top 14 clubs are not putting money into their local area, into their local clubs. They're putting money into this by bringing players from overseas. And it, it, it is wrong on every sense. Uh, there's no two ways about it. The, the problem, again, sits with world rugby where... Um, people that oppose this are not getting supported because Australia and New Zealand and, and France and to a lesser degree England um, don't support the changes. Now, that they have moved things a little bit where they're saying that once you, if you, if you are, it'd be like being a, an Irish player and you go to New Zealand and you might play a test for New Zealand, but after that you can go back for Ireland. Now, you can't because Ireland is a top-tier nation. But if it's one of the, the listed nations, especially in the South Pacific, or Chile or, or, or one of the, the lesser uh, tier, the tier two or tier three countries, if you play the tests for, or, or A games or sevens for one of the tier one countries, you can go back and play for those other, other countries. And it's only right. Like they've got, they've got so much talent that they're not allowed to pick. Or on the other side, they've got talent that's playing over in Europe. And, that in, and we know, I've seen the contracts. They get offered two contracts. Here's a contract if you don't play for Tonga or Samoa, and it's it's sixty thousand or seventy thousand less than this contract. That if you do play for Tonga or Samoa, so in other words, you don't. You say I'm not available to play, and we'll pay a hundred grand, seventy grand, sixty grand more to play for our club. There's all these anomalies going in the system that are absolutely against the smaller countries, and they're being propagated by the bigger countries. And you only have to look through. Um, where the players were born in the, this this test series this year. Look through the countries on where the players were born. Now rugby's got a long history of players travelling between countries, and and that's something we should um, encourage and endorse. But in, that was meant for amateur days when people migrated or you were studying. That was the big one. People were studying overseas as in their early twenties. The, they were in the amateur days. You could play for that country. That that loophole, like we just spoke about the laws, has been exploited. So that now Australia, I think it was had 12 and New Zealand had 14 players born overseas, usually in the Pacifica region. The Argentinians uh, are playing basically with the entire squad. I think there's one player that was born in Italy. Um, the rest of them they were all born in Argentina. You, gotta, you know, that, that, that is the case. Japan is another one that's benefiting hugely from that system with so many players born overseas. It's It's... Uh, against the smaller countries and pro the bigger countries, or not necessarily bigger, but financially with the clout. So it's good to see Fekatoa playing for Tonga against Ireland in the World Cup, and and that is a move that hopefully will, you know, just have conversations start about it more often, so that the pressure ramps up on World Rugby to say, okay, we actually need to address this at at um, 
at base level maybe we could help by investing some money in the schools rugby systems to keep players and to give them the opportunity to have that schooling you know there's definitely a way around that that isn't just like um oh we're a colonial power who have better education so therefore we can take your young people and um and give them a better life than they would have like that doesn't really seem to be helping the situation really no it's not true but it's even more than that but what world rugby can do is empower the national teams of Fiji, Samoa and Tonga to have an even crack at it. So they can play uh, at, a, at a very high level. So that if you're a to- Tongan or a Samoan, uh, even even the grandchild of Tongans and Samoans, like I'm, I'm a grandchild of I- Irish grandparents, so I've got an affiliation with Ireland, the, grand- the grandchildren of Tongans, Samoans and, and Fijians, if they believe their national team's got a fair crack at winning and it's got these tours and plays in decent competitions like Australia and New Zealand do, then you, they'll declare for them. But they're not going to declare for Fiji and Samoa if they know they're only going to play once every four years in a serious competition. That's really where the core of it is. Now, look, the, the national bodies of those, of those countries, as um, Dan Leo's wonderful um, documentary, I just can't remember the name of the documentary he put out last year, showed there is corruption at the elite end of the game as well. There is serious questions to be asked about the governance of the game at the top end in those countries. So players, there's a whole uh, uh, environment of why the players aren't going there. It's not just the education. It's not just taking kids out at 13 and 14. Is that those kids don't see their national team as giving them a shot to play international rugby, whereas they say, well, if I can play for the Wallabies or I can play for New Zealand, yeah. I, I got a shot at it. So, so there's a whole raft of things world rugby is doing. But, but they're not doing much of anything. That's the problem. They're not addressing it at any at re, with real substance at any level. The documentary is called Oceans Apart. That's it, Oceans Apart. Great documentary. I'd encourage every sports person, especially rugby people, to watch it. it. It was very controversial, raised a lot of really difficult issues for rugby to face. And unfortunately, like a lot of these great works, it was praised at the time, spoken about, and... The politicians just wait till the, the pressure dies down and just carry on as normal. Um, Matt, the All Blacks were, were far more impressive last weekend than the previous weekend, of course, but uh, I don't know if you managed to see it, kind of doing the rounds on social media and you can read whatever you want into this, but the, the video of, of Joe Schmidt and, and Jason Ryan up in, the, up in the box after the game and obviously slow motion replays uh, maybe make these things out to be more than they were, but uh, certainly a, a cold sort of a reaction to... Uh, from from Jason Ryan when when Schmidt tried to give him a, a little fist bump and a tap on the shoulder as well after the match, um, obviously uh, Ryan has his loyalty to, to Scott Robertson as well, uh, so there's something there's something there perhaps. But uh, Joe Schmidt's impact on this New Zealand attack is is quite clearly already evident to see. I think we've got to wait till next week. I'll probably lose. The way they go. <laughs> <laughs> like, how can you pick New Zealand rugby? Yeah, no consistency. Like, like they played magnificently at uh, Ellis Park. They were absolutely sensational at Ellis Park um, and beat South Africa out the gate. They then come home and were appalling uh, in, in Christchurch in the first test and then were magnificent again. Were fantastic against the island at Eden Park, were horrible in the next two tests. They're really up and down at the moment. Um, look, whether... Joe and Jason have built a relationship. They don't know each other. They're only just going out. Um, I, I, I can't comment. You know, sometimes you, you see things and they're just not true. Anyone reads stuff into it. They were sitting there bef- as the game was ending uh, with Ian Foster, laying back, laughing, having a giggle because they knew they'd won. Probably saying, I wonder what the media are going to say tonight because they played really fantastic rugby. They're, they're, um, they were far more accurate than they have been. But then, look, again, we, we can't read anything into this, really, apart from they are capable of playing magnificent rugby because since November last year, New Zealand have been just inconsi- have shown an inconsistency that we have never seen, I have never seen from a New Zealand team in my lifetime, and no one has. The New Zealand media must be saying, well, we usually only have to be horrible human beings for a week or two each year. Now we've got to do it consistently because we don't know what they're going to do. But in Hamilton, they were sensational. They outplayed um, Argentina. They were more physical. They were more accurate. They scored some absolutely spectacular tries, like 100-metre jobs. And they were far, far superior than they were the week before uh, when they were the exact opposite, the absolute mirror image of what they were 
uh, in Hamilton. So let's see. They're going to Melbourne for a Bledisloe Cup uh, against the Wallabies that they should win and win very well. Again, as I said, Australian rugby, if Australian rugby gets out of the Bledisloe Cup with one win, I think they've done exceptionally well. I think they've got one game at Eden Park, so they're certainly not going to win that. It, 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 so you've got to say right now, in a very even competition, like the New Zealand are on 10, all three other countries are on nine, so there's one point between Argentina at the bottom and, and New Zealand at the top, and that's all on tries. So you can see New Zealand 14 tries, let five in, South Africa 10 tries, let nine in, the Wallabies 11 tries, let 15 in, and the Argentinian side 10 tries, let 16 in. So it's all about who defends and stops the opposition scoring tries. And right now, New Zealand are doing that better than anyone. So they've got a great staff, great players, and they should go on to win the championship. Mark, good stuff. We leave it there. Thanks a million. Pleasure now. That's uh, Matt Williams giving us some thoughts this morning. A reminder, OTB AM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today. Kathy McNamee in the hot seat uh, alongside myself tomorrow for a reaction to Ireland's game against Slovakia. We'll also be joined by Emma Byrne. And Graham Hunter is going to join us to talk about the return of the Champions League tonight. Right now, we're going to leave you with the great Pat Nevin. Enjoy. See you tomorrow. Before the game, it was difficult, you know, because you know, Rangers had uh, certainly improved over the last year. They got to that Europa League final in uh, Seville, which I was at that game as well. So they'd beat a lot of teams. They'd also got through to the Champions League group stage by beating PSV Eindhoven. So the gap between them and Celtic seemed to have uh, closed it seemed to have closed <laughs> until the game started. Uh, and Celtic were extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And uh, I tend not to get too carried away with Scottish football in the Scottish Premier League too often. Um, but I have to say, Celtic were an amazing... They are an amazing team to watch. And they have been for... Since the day Ange Postecoglou basically came into the club. Uh, but in this game, it's it was a joy to be there. And that, that's with their best player, going off injured after two or three minutes. Um, but they were still... They play a type of football that... I can't remember anyone playing it to that level before. This speed of closing down, but not just closing down. It's the, a, a few people have talked about it. I'm sure Tom will talk about it later. Every time they get a free kick or a throw-in, do you know you, you take free kicks or throw-ins quickly? Mate, that, that's one of the tactics you do, right? Not them. It's lightning. It's like two seconds. And everyone else, the, the opposition are looking around, complaining. They've gone. They're away. They've scored. And they do it, and they keep on doing it, and they keep on... And it's easy to do that, but to do that with with the speed, but with a skill as well, on, honestly, it was it was brilliant to watch Celtic. And they went 4-0. It could have been more against Rangers, who are not a bad side. But Celtic are a bit special at the moment. Yeah, no, they're in fantastic form going into the Champions League. All right, it's a very difficult game against Real Madrid this week that they have, but... Everyone kind of looked at the 9 0 the week before and went, Look, that's beating a team who are already beaten Docket when you've put a few goals past them in the first half. But as you mentioned, this Rangers team are no mugs. Last year, they were very good, particularly away from home in the run in the Europa League. Um, they got a little bit of luck against PSV when they had a bit of closing down and it was a golden opportunity that was handed to them. But still, under Van Bronckhurst, they've been very good at going away from home and being difficult to beat. And Celtic just brushed them aside. Uh, and which I have to say, I was surprised. I think Celtic were still favourites going into it. Uh, they had a very good team last season. They had decent depth last season. They've added brilliantly this season as well. Even the players that they let go, you know, there were good players like Nier Beaton, and, uh, but they couldn't play that, that specific style, as the Celtic fans call it, Ange Ball. Uh, Postal Coglu, he just asked them to do this incredible thing at this incredible pace with, you know, a, cr- a brilliant team spirit. And I mean, I was walking out talking to quite a few. Uh, Celtic people on the way out of uh, the game in at half time and one former Celtic player said to me that's the best I've seen since the Lisbon Lions and I'm going whoa wait a minute <laughs> steady on there <laughs> it's pushing it a bit I've watched so many great Celtic teams over the years you know the, the team that had Doug Leash and Danny McGrain and David Hay and they, they were amazing um, and a lot of decent teams since then but the excitement around it is spectacular but as you ra- rightly say you know you find out when you get to the Champions League group stages and it's a hell of a hard group that they're, they're in. And and we'll find out. I'm not saying they're going to win that group or even get out, but they're not going to be a walkover. They're going to be a very tough team to play against. Um, but it, it really is is very, very exciting to watch them. And, and being at Celtic Park for, you know, for any Celtic Rangers game, it's always an, an amazing atmosphere or European nights are always incredible. And I'm, I'm old enough and I, I can tell... Both you, Will and Dan. I know you're not as old as me, right? But I was there in 1980 
when Celtic played uh, Real Madrid then, Laurie Cunningham was playing for Real Madrid and Celtic done them at Celtic Park. And I think it was 3-2, they could beat overall in the time. But they're massively competitive against the world-class side and they're, they're going that direction again now. I don't know if they're there yet, but I, I, I can't wait. I really can't wait to see how they do. And this game against Real Madrid in Tuesday night is going to be extraordinary. Yeah, I think what's interesting for me, Pat, is that like you mentioned Ange Ball or how it's described by the, the sort of the, the regulars there. Like, do you think it's possible they can translate that, that that will be their approach in the Real Madrid game? Because some of the European nights I've been at Celtic, like when Neil Lennon was in charge and stuff, and it was, it was about being more patient. It was a different type of performance, like Barcelona and a couple of games like that. Um, whereas you described the tempo they operate at when they're on a, on a going day. Like, would you expect to see that tomorrow? 100%. That's what they're going to do, right? They will not do anything else. If it doesn't work, Angie's a bit like, um, you know, like Pep, Guardiola, they play their way. And if they get beat and people say, oh, you should have been a bit cuter, you shouldn't have played so many players forward or, you know, whatever. And Pep looks at you as if you're stupid. As if, why, why would we change? This works most of the time. Now and again, it doesn't. You just go on and keep on doing it. That's post Coglu. There's no way they're sitting back. There's no way they're not going to try and do to Real Madrid what they try and do to everyone. Now, it might not work, but it won't be for lack of trying to play that way. I, I have a suspicion, and I suspect Posta Coglu understands too, if they try and play a different way in a, a more defensive way, they'll get done. Because mm. I don't know if they'll, they'll be that good at that. But if they try and impose their game, and uh, another one of the phrases uh, coming out of Celtic Park was uh, someone had said to me, yeah, that's the Celtic way, which is, you know, and I remember I was a, a schoolboy for him, and it seemed for Celtic and a supporter when I was a kid. And there was a phrase we used to have at the time was score an early goal and press on regardless. And that was, didn't matter who you played against, that's how you played. That's how you, that was the attitude. That's back at Celtic Park now. And it will take something incredible to stop that happening. Now, it might be a, an absolute horsing by somebody, mm -hmm. but I think before that happens, you're going to just see the same thing. So um, it's definitely worth tuning into that game just to see where they are. Um, and 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 I would I'm disappointed that Kyogo's not will, probably won't be playing. It damaged his shoulder badly, but the fact that they've got really good backup and they made five substitutions substitutions against Rangers, and not one of them made them weaker, not one, and that shows you where they are just now and what he's trying to do. Maybe the the question mark would probably remain to some degree with the centre backs. They're going to be up against a not a bad centre forward, <laughs> so Carter Vickers and Starfelt. I start felt uh, he got injured the weekend and Jens might have to come in. But Carter Vickers was, has been brilliant and improving and reading the game better. And maybe that's another thing at Postacoglu. He's making decent players good players. He's making good players very good players and he's making very good players look like great players. Just moving them on that bit. But a, a lot more questions are going to be asked of that defence. And I, I tell you now, I don't know the answer. But I'm, I am seriously looking forward to finding out. And anybody that goes to Celtic Park, I mean, you've, you remember you used to hear Barcelona players in their great days saying, you know, I remember Deco talking about it, I remember other people talking about it saying, they loved Celtic Park. They just should, couldn't shut up about it after having been there. So it's, it's going to have an effect. It definitely has an effect. Might be a slightly different uh, job trying to stop Vinicius and Benzema tomorrow night, but exactly, we, exactly. <laughs> I, I will not argue for that for a second. Um, <laughs> but to, to one upside this, and here's here's an analogy. Then um, again, I'm not saying don't miss goal. I'm not saying they're going to win. But if you watch the Premier League this season and you watch Chelsea when they went to play against Leeds, they were just out fought, weren't they? Mm. And don't, I was at the game. And then teams going up, you know, let's. Liverpool been shocked by Fulham because they were out fought for periods. You know, so your, your Brighton will do that to you. Uh, Fulham will do that to you. Newcastle will do that to you against the very top teams. Newcastle get a draw, as do Villa against Man City. If you go and attack these teams with energy and don't sit back scared out of your life, you just never know. You absolutely just never know. And that's I think that's the whole attitude that, you know, it's time not to be fearful. It's time to you know, I either win or go down in a blaze of glory. And, and that's that's kind of how I like my football. Well, football here on Off The Ball is with thanks to Sky, proud partner of our women's national football team, of course, out of tomorrow's game against Slovakia especially. Pat, to go from Celtic to one of your former teams in Chelsea, you just mentioned there, 
they were the perhaps beneficiary of one of the bad VAR decisions over the weekend where somehow West Ham's late equaliser wasn't given and it was a judge that Mendy was fouled in the build-up to it. We might talk about VAR in a more general sense, but in a way, Chelsea were very lucky to get the three points in that derby at the weekend. Uh, extremely lucky. I think they were the better team. Um, there was a rotten first half, but they were probably the better team in the second half. So, you know, and chances in play, and they probably were slightly the better side. But you're right. Just that last minute, and it was a really interesting thing to watch. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, I think a lot of people, myself included, rewound that and froze it about 20 times to see what the hell was going on. Now, they, this is the honest truth of it. They got it wrong. There, there's no doubt, they got it wrong. Because VA is there for a simple thing, is to get the obvious decisions right when they've been called wrong. They, that wasn't an obvious decision. Absolutely not. Now, if you slow it down and you look at... Um, Jared Bowen's leg, his left leg, as he as he goes for the ball, he goes to jump over Mendy, and he lets it trail. Let's be honest about it. He lets it trail. We've all done it, and, and he's not trying to hurt Mendy, but he lets it trail. At a push, that's a free kick, but it's not an obvious, serious mistake by the referee. So they got it wrong, but I understand why they made the decision, but they still got it wrong, um, and I felt. Really quite sorry for Moise because these things worked really hard. From a Chelsea's perspective, they're shouting at you. Did anybody remember the exact same position a few weeks ago when Cucurella had his hair pulled? <laughs> and, and, and you're talking shed end a yard away and they lost two points out of that because he wasn't sent off the 10 men, they put the corner and scored. So... There's a few Chelsea folk out there going, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you're making a big song and dance about that. What about... And it maybe does, arguably, you know, even itself up, but not for a millisecond am I arguing that West Ham shouldn't have scored. It, it should have been a goal, it should have been a draw, and I did feel really sorry for Moisey and for uh, West Ham. Away from the VR, how are Chelsea now settling with these new signings, Pat? Because there's been like a, a summer of great change with players who've left, particularly up front within the team, and losing two defenders in Rudiger and Christensen on top of that. So naturally, you know, Bowley was going to come in and he had to uh, spend some money to regenerate the squad. But it's almost like unrecognisable compared to the team that won the Champions League at this stage, and 280 million has been spent. Uh, what do you make of Chelsea's business, and how are those players now settling in early on? Right, A, it's very hard to tell because it's really early. Chelsea had five players, five outside outfield players of the ten that started who weren't available to them last season. So, you know, you Sterling, Cucurella, Gallagher, uh, Fafana and Koulibaly. So they didn't play for them last season. So to find yourselves, that's just last season. That's not even Champions League season the year before. So when uh, Thomas Tuchel says this is a transitional time and people are going, A, transitional? <laughs> He just won the Champions League a year and a bit ago. But it's been a wild time for that football club. You know, the change of ownership, number of players going, complete rejig of the team. Um, and the fact that they are, if you look at the league table just now, where they are actually amazes me. Because I was at the game against Everton. They were not good. They were, I was at the game against Leeds United. They were hopeless. Um, watched the game live that they played against Southampton. Didn't deserve to win that one either. Southampton were the better side. So, you know, that is definitely, um, it's, it's, it's changing, it's adapting. But just for the first time, I'm beginning to see some joined up thinking. It seemed a wee bit scattergun, didn't it? You know, oh, he's available, we'll buy him. You know, we'll, mm. we'll get him, he's available. But now you look at it, you think Fofana, good, really good buy. You needed a centre back there or else they had no chance. Kill Bali, you know, jury out to some degree but he'll, he'll do a, a good job because Thiago Silva's a, a, a beside him um, but when you start looking at you know say if Aubameyang I don't think he'll play every game but if you got Aubameyang up front with Sterling and Kai Havertz off him well that's pretty good that's that's good goals there and that's before you think well if you don't get their two behind a striker you could always put Mason Mount and Gallagher and you think oh actually that's all right there was question marks over Cucurella, but I don't think it should be. I think he's a fabulous player. But what that's done is put a massive amount of pressure on Ben Chilwell. And how does he react to that? Well, you saw on the weekend how he reacted to that. Rhys James has just sent, signed a new six-year contract today. So it's taken a while. And I would say, if you asked me the question two weeks ago, I wasn't putting them top four this season. No chance. And I'm looking at it now thinking, 
actually, that that looks quite joined up now. That actually looks like a little bit of strength and depth in the right areas. And certainly with the players that are ageing a little bit, you know, Kante is a phenomenal player, but he's getting more injured more often. Jorginho's maybe a bit slower than he was. They had to strengthen, and uh, it looks like they've done that pretty well. Arsenal still sit top of the table. They've suffered their first defeat of the season, and in a way, there was something very kind of typical about the way that this game went, where Arsenal had a lot of the ball. They had some very good spells, especially the first 15 minutes of the second half. It was like Arsenal were laying siege to Manchester United, but United picked them off on three counter-attacks effectively and that was enough to win the game. There was a very kind of old-school feel of United versus Arsenal in the way that the result played out. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's hard. I keep on saying it, everyone. The Premier League this season looks a wee bit different to me than it has done for a few years. You don't really go anywhere and cruise. There's, there's almost nowhere you go and cruise. Everywhere you go, you've got a battle. And that's going to be the same if you're, you know, if you're Man City or you're Arsenal going away from home. I think you're going to have to battle for the vast majority of games. So it's still a, a tough gig with a little bit of form being showed by, shown um, by uh, Manchester United now. Um, I, I like the way they, they set up. Again, I've talked on this show all the way through last season to quite a bit of abuse, saying that Ronaldo's an impact player now. He's not your main striker. And of course, I'm getting people shouting at me going, ah, he's scored all these goals. It's not about that. It's about if you're going to be competitive, you need to be able to close and harry from the front. And it just doesn't happen when you've got, you know, Bruno and Bruno Fernandes and Ronaldo on the team against the very top teams. And they get picked off last season because of it. The way they're using them now, and if Ten Hag can keep on using them this way, that's brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. And you just look at the the energy there was around that team, a lot more energy. Now, they're not a high-pressing team yet, nothing like it. But it looks like everybody's working as a unit now. So, yeah, it's well done, Manchester United. And they are a decent team when they do that and everybody works together. Arsenal, I still like them. I still think they're great. I still think they're really good players. And I will hold by still. That if I had to choose between Spurs and Arsenal for top four, I'm still Spurs. Mm. I've been Spurs, Spurs since the start of the season. I'm still Spurs. Uh, really grown-up management. Uh, real intelligence about the way they play. Um, I'm going to see them next week. And I can't wait to see them in the flesh at their own stadium. Um, I, I think with what they've got going forward, and this is with Son not even playing particularly well yet, I, I think they're really special too. I suspect that Man United, Chelsea, Arsenal, they could all be fighting for that full spot. Tara is an Arsenal fan and that boy who's been in contact on 53106. Uh, what did Pat think of Arteta's game management yesterday? Seemed a bit frazzled by the occasion. Yeah, he does get a bit excitable, doesn't he? It's one of those things, you know, when managers, you know, get really excitable and get, you know, get so involved and you can see all the passion and they win and everybody loves them for it and everyone goes, wow, that's exactly what we want. That's what the fans want. And when you lose, they say, oh, he's lost, lost control. You can't win that one. It's over a period of time. Yes, there was a lot of pressure on that one. The expectations were high. He, is, he was a bit frazzled with you know, a number of decisions like everybody else is. But I'm, I'm OK with that. I think that's fine. I think that level of passion is OK because he's shown that he's grown that into a better team. Over his period in charge, it's taken a while, but he's grown that team to be a better team, a, a better young team, a, a team built in his own image. Um, it'd be harsh, it's slightly harsh to call them Manchester City light, but there, there is a wee bit of that about them. But that's maybe not the worst thing you can say about anyone, is it? Um, no, I, I have to say I like Man City. And the other thing is, Odegaard's a brilliant player, right? And Saka with a really good game, and Zinchenko's been a great buy. But Gabriel Jesus, I have to say, he looks he looks a different player. He, he looks because he's more of the main man now. He's kind of grown, and it's it's interesting to see that. Same happened to Raheem Sterling at Chelsea. Take them out and say to them, right, you're basically the main man. Some of them melt and others grow. And Gabriel Jesus, I think he's grown with it. So uh, yeah, I think I think Arsenal fans should be... I, I'm not telling them to be delighted. I know they are. I know they feel good about this team. And OK, so you get the odd defeat uh, and they'll be disappointed and frustrated. But no, they're a good team. They're, and they're great to watch as well. 
uh, we kind of cycle through your ex-clubs here when I think of Everton against Liverpool perhaps not the most memorable of uh, Merseyside derbies but plenty of um, ebbs and flows within the game I know you were at the Celtic Rangers game at the same time but um, Liverpool particularly hitting the crossbar a couple of times in the first half Luis Diaz took a strip of paint off the inside of the post on the follow up after the Darwin Nunes chance and then Everton possibly could have had a goal through Conor Cody again it was one of those kind of controversial ones in the weekend but to put a Liverpool perspective on it that's now four games so far Pat that dropped points in I know Man City weren't able to go top because of their draw against Aston Villa, but how concerning is it for Liverpool the amount of points they've dropped in the first month of the season? No, they'd be concerned if it's comparing themselves with the, you know, the points they got previous seasons, yeah. But, you know, I was at the 9-0 game, so I, I might be slightly <laughs> biased <laughs> since I've seen them play quite well that day. Um, but no, there's so much quality there. The one thing that I... Laurie, two, two things about Liverpool, and it's not being negative because we all know all the positives right we all know the great players they've got we all know that they will score a lot of goals I had a question mark of creation from the midfield um, whether they will get so many goals from the fullback areas the geniuses up front were great you know but you know people breaking from midfield and scoring or being ultra creative you know Thiago fine but was it enough they're adding that now you know Harvey Elliott's He's been fabulous. I mean, he got taken off in that 9-0 game at half time, and he was definitely the best player in the park. De- definitely the best player in the park. He's very, very special. And I, I, I definitely think they've, they knew, know what they needed to add there. So that's taken a wee bit of time. There's a couple of technical things that have changed um, with Liverpool. It's, it's kind of not that easy to see. One, one particular one I've noticed early on, which they need to figure out. Andy Robertson used to get a hell of a lot of the ball on that left-hand side, always free left-hand side, slewing all these balls in all day long and creating lots of goals, right? Not been as many lately. Now, is that Andy Robertson, a lesser player, or is that the fact that Sadio Mane's gone? And he used to take that position and drive out of it and leave this enormous gap because people were scared of him and ran with him. They've got a different type of player out left-hand side now most days. And it's kind of stifling that wee bit of their game. It's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. It's, they put a great set of players that are attack-minded on the left-hand side, but it's also cut off some of the space for Andy again. Too. So they, I'm suspecting 